Chair Malari, are you ready to begin? I am. Okay. Just one moment. Hold on. Just give me one. Bear with me for one moment, folks. I apologize. Okay, we're ready to begin when you are, Chair Malari. I'll call the uh, May 25th, 2023 City of American Canyon Planning Commission meeting to order. Uh, if you all may stand uh, for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Nicole, may I have a roll call, please? Yes, yes. One moment. Commissioner Altman? Present. Commissioner Goff? Present. Commissioner Mohammed? Present. Vice Chair Cruz? Present. Chair Malare? Present. Okay. Um, at this time, I'm going to open up public comment. This time is reserved for the members of the City of American Canyon to address any issues that are not on the current agenda. Um, please hold your comments to three minutes. Nicole. Yes. Um, all right. Oh, there we go. You should. Let's see, hold on. Public comments open, we're just waiting for this. Yeah, Mayor Garcia. We're getting you some assistance right there. All right, I have here uh, Yvonne. Um, I'm passing out a map that shows you how much land is being conserved in the South County for wildlife. This map was just completed by the Napa County Planning Department and includes the City of American Canyon. Notice how little is being protected, especially near the wetlands and the Sonoma-Napa Marsh. The most unrecognized threat to South Napa County is the loss of native foraging and breeding grounds. It's going to be a disaster a mass extinction of wildlife in our county. Don't you think it's time that the city and county come together to line out the land that needs to remain for future generations? 
I see how difficult it is for each of you to be effective and how impossible it is to change what you've learned, how the laws and policies that were put in place 20 years ago are now restricting the possibilities of appropriate actions for today's realities. It's only been a year for me and I've had to do a lot of research and investigation to bring myself up to speed on the environmental harm that is planned for the City of American Canyon over the next decade. It was only a year ago that I stood up for the first time before the City Council and spoke up against Measure J. I had no idea that I'd be writing the ballot opposition narrative and campaigning against the measure for the next six months. Even though Measure J was defeated by voters, I noticed that it's still one of the goals of this city to develop the Green Island Vineyard by 2040, and I don't understand how this is possible. Now I'm standing before all of you. The first step in this city's economic development comes before each of you. Take a look at this map. The cumulative impact of all the warehouses and commercial development will wipe out every inch of foraging habitat for a large number of animals. Right now, the City of American Canyon is facing three lawsuits challenging the buildup of the 204-acre Giovanoni property. This Planning Commission and the City Council approved the warehouse development. There were letters of concern, emails of worry, and people testifying that the environmental impact report was flawed. While the city is embroiled in litigation regarding this property and taxpayers are paying the legal bills, I wonder how much of this could have been avoided if American Canyon public officials carefully reviewed, responded to, and did their best in causing no more harm. Have each of you read the writ of mandate filed with the Napa Superior Court? I have, and I'm shocked at the rampant disregard the developers and city officials showed for the natural environment including disregarding a letter from the California Department 30 of Fish, seconds. Fish and Wildlife, which asked for the consideration in leaving more foraging land available for predatory birds. I watched the proponents of economic development stand here and brag about the jobs and tax revenue they'll be creating while they're not talking about the cost of the quality of life for each one of us. Our natural world is our most valuable asset. Please consider this in each and every decision. The city of American Canyon is the most biologically diverse region of this county. Let's keep it that way. Thank you, Yvonne. Do we have any more public comment? Nicole, is there anyone on, online? If you are on Zoom and would like to make public comment on anything that is not on the agenda, please raise your hand at this time. Nobody's raising their hand. Thank you. I'll go ahead and close public comment. Director Cooper, do we have any agenda changes? Uh, thank you, Chair Malari. I have no changes tonight. Right. Moving on to the consent calendar. Looking for a recommendation to approve the minutes of the April 27th, 2023 Planning Commission meeting. I make a motion that we approve the consent calendar. I'll second that, I'll second that motion. Roll call, please. Commissioner Altman? Aye. Commissioner Goff? Aye. Commissioner Muhammad? Aye. Vice Chair Cruz? Aye. Chair Malari? Abstain. All right, moving on to uh, Ch Chicken Guy Restaurant Conditional Use Permit. All right, uh, good evening, um, uh, Chair Malari, members of the Planning Commission, and members of the public. Uh, my name is William with the Planning Division, and uh, very happy to be here today to give a presentation on the Chicken Guy project. Um, this project was continued from uh, last month, so this presentation will be pretty brief as a refresher to the project. So this is the location map for the uh, project site. The site is at uh, 200 American Canyon Road, and it is south of the Walgreens and accessible from Broadway Street on the southeast. 
uh, planning and zoning information for the site. It is a uh, 1.03 acre site within the neighborhood commercial zone. The project consists of a 2,818 square foot restaurant with drive through. It is a single story building uh, that's about 20 feet tall with a uh, five foot parapet, so 25 feet overall. It includes 70 seats, uh, indoor seats, uh, 29 uh, parking spaces, and um, uh, business hours. Oh, I think the business hours should be 10 a.m. to 12 a.m. Um, here is the site plan to the project. Um, the building is shown in blue, and the project site, the one over acre site, is shown with the red hatches. Uh, entry is from the southeast and the drive-through is to the west of the site. Uh, this is a reminder of the, the building colors. It is of a modern industrial type building. It includes their, um, uh, the Chicken Guy logo and is a single story with the angled red arches for, uh, for their um, drive-through. So, um, Going back to last month's uh, uh, planning commission, the project was continued upon the applicant's request. One of the uh, lingering items um, that needed to be resolved was the drive-through feature that was uh, the main concern of the public. And um, we concluded that one of the items that the uh, planning commission directed the applicant to uh, get was the traffic study. Um, they've been working with staff uh, in good faith and provided a couple of drafts for their traffic study. And um, we think that the, the main reason for the traffic study is to assess how many trips that it is uh, that the project will uh, contribute and uh, the trip gen would lead to their traffic impact fee. And um, we think that the traffic impact study could be deferred into their construction permits and it is a condition of approval that the applicant has agreed upon. Um, with that being said, staff's uh, approval, staff's recommendation is approval of the Chicken Guy continue, uh, conditional use permit because the project complies with the findings of a CUP and also it uh, complies with the uh, uh, Broadway District Specific Plan final EIR. Um, that's all that I have for the refresher to the continued project. I'll be here if you have any questions, and also the, the applicants are here. Thank you, William. Um, at this point, I'll go ahead and open public comment to address any topic on the Chicken Guy restaurant. Nicole, do we have anyone online? Yes, we have Allison. Allison, I am going to unmute you. And Hello, good evening, everyone. Uh, may I begin? Yes, 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 please. Thank you. Um, my name is Allison Bensick, and I am a junior at American Canyon High School. And along with Liliana Koresh at Napa High School, we are both co-leading Napa Schools for Climate Action. And tonight, I'm speaking on behalf of Schools for Climate Action. And with that, I would like to share our support for the denial of the new drive through restaurant permits. We are currently in the midst of a climate crisis and we need to crack down on the amount of fossil fuels being burned to mitigate the already worsening effects of global warming. Fossil fuels contribute to over 75% of all greenhouse gas emissions and nearly 90% of all carbon dioxide emissions these increasing emissions continue to blanket the earth in heat trapping gases, and our global temperature has already been raised by 1.2 degrees Celsius. And by many accounts, we are rapidly approaching 1.5 degrees Celsius, which means we'll have to suffer even more severe impacts, especially the younger people who have done the least to cause this problem. Furthermore, our NVOSD high schools, starting with American Canyon High School, are trying to get this important message out. We started with students participating in the Napa County Climate Challenge, and with that, together, 
we're learning about climate pollution and we're learning about how it needs to be drastically cut down at this point in the climate crisis. And we must put the future of younger generations ahead of these short-term conveniences such as drive-throughs. And with that, we would like our government to join the climate challenge and do all that it can to help protect our youth. To start, we have to stop building more infrastructure that encourages the burning of more fossil fuels and emissions of more heat trapping climate pollution. American Canyon, like all communities, has to shift toward the direction of net zero carbon emissions by or before 2030 if we wish to have a safe future. We see the denial of this permit application as a solidarity effort in support of Napa Schools for Climate Action's efforts to redu reduce climate pollution. And we applaud the city of Napa for recently denying a drive-through permit for a fast food restaurant on the basis of negative health and climate impacts. We trust that you will do the same. And on behalf of Schools for Climate Action, we thank you for your time tonight. Thank you, Allison. Next, we have Marilyn Knight Mendelson. I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. Yes, good evening. Marilyn Knight Mendelson. I am the co chair of Napa Climate Now, and I heartily agree with the comments made by Allison and the excellent work that her organization is doing to protect our planet. I want, I also would like to oppose the drive through element of the Chicken Guy restaurant. We aren't opposing the restaurant itself, but the drive through aspect. And obviously, as Allison just explained, it's because the drive through element will cause unwanted and unnecessary pollution. We don't need it. We are happy to have the restaurant, but the drive-through element just um, brings about really unnecessary problems. Um, I was a co-organizer of yesterday's Napa Climate Summit. And at that summit, Kate Miller, the executive director of Napa Valley Transportation Authority, identified idling emissions as one of the key problems to be addressed in reducing transportation emissions. Quite clearly, there it was up on her PowerPoint, do not idle vehicles. It's not necessary. It's low hanging fruit. Let's all work together to start there by not offering the drive through aspect of the chicken guys application. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Marilyn. Next, we have Tammy Wong. Tammy, please unmute yourself. Um, good evening, commissioners. Um, I wholeheartedly agree with the earlier speakers and their comments about why the Chicken Guy drive through restaurant proposal is not a good fit for our community. Um, from my previous public comments, um, I, I am against this project because of the air pollution, the greenhouse gases. Um, but one of the things that concerns me is that it looks like a decision is going to be made without benefit of the traffic study. All we know is the, um, the project developer's estimate of 7% of the traffic is going to be through the drive through and it's going to be 1300 new cars a day. Well, how does that impact that intersection? How does it impact the adjacent roads? What's the impact on those trying to reach American Canyon High School? What about the students who walk or ride their bicycle to the high school? How is this additional traffic going to impact them? Unfortunately, we don't have a traffic study to have any of that information before a decision is made. Um, Personally, I think we need to see the traffic study. I don't know why it's sort of like backwards, but um, but anyways, I guess what I really want to ask you is, is we desperately need leadership in our city to prioritize sustainability and a livable planet to make those choices over the conveniences like a drive-through. And so 
I'm, I'm heartened by earlier discussions that the Planning Commission has had regarding sustainability. And I hope tonight, if you do go ahead and make a decision, that you will keep in mind the future generations um, that live here, as, as well as the impact that the wildlife have um, with the air quality and, and such. Thank you. Next, excuse me. Um, next, we have Lori Stelling. Lori, please unmute yourself. Thank you and good evening. Uh, my name is Lori Stelling and I'm the parent of a Napa teen who continues to follow this and other valley-wide fossil fuel station and drive-through development decisions. Um, I'm st I always strive to support pathways to help each jurisdiction meet their goal of net zero climate pollutants by 2030. And I urge you to support the future and health of our youth by denying the drive through element of the proposed chicken guy drive through restaurant. I read the city attorney's letter to the planning commission about the fact that the city of American Canyon's July 2022 climate emergency resolution did not prohibit new drive throughs. But from my point of view, this does not seem to me to be a good reason to approve permits for restaurant projects that would actually increase idling in 2023. And a question I have is, are our valley-wide climate emergency resolutions not a call to strive to reach net zero climate pollutants by 2030 on behalf of our children and grandchildren having the chance at a livable future? I, um, I recently read something um, from climate scientist and one of the leading authors of the most recent IPCC report from the United Nations, um, Dr. Joelle Gurgis share that we have urgent decisions to make about how much will be lost to future generations. Perhaps the most important message to come out of the latest IPCC report is this, how bad we let things get is still in our hands. Additional warming will be determined by future emissions. That is what policies governments around the world choose to do to re to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and restore ecosystems will directly lead to restabilizing the Earth's climate or not. As a parent, I, I vote that we restabilize the Earth's climate in every way we can, including denying new projects that increase idling pollutants in our communities. I also feel it's tremendously important to give Allison and all of our youth the message that we care about their chance for a livable future. And I agree with what the other speakers shared tonight about that the convenience of a drive through restaurant is really, I see this as sort of a preference versus a need that within our new normal of climate emergency and worsening air pollution, drive through convenience is not a need any longer when we can have a park, turn off your car, pick up, services for those who are unable to leave their vehicle and walk into restaurants. So I strongly urge you to deny the drive through element of this permit and meet the needs of this difficult moment. And I really do feel that working Please together- Please wrap up your comments. Yep, working together community by community, project by project, I do believe that we can make a significant difference in future emissions and Thank give you, our Laurie. children Do you have any more public comment? If there's anyone else who would like to make comment, please raise your hand now. Okay, those of you in the audience, um, if you have you filled up. How much do you have? Do you have speaker yep. cards, Chair Malari? Yep. Okay. I have um, Kenneth Leary. Good evening. Chair and commissioners. I am in favor of reducing our fossil fuels and our input impact on the climate. Uh, this reminds me about the discussion regarding leaf blowers. We talk about the smallest things to do to change and to impact the environment while the dead horse is flowing through our town all the way to Calistoga every day. 
the business of Napa is tourism. And tourists come here and they drive their cars to a hotel, then to wineries from both ends of the valley to the top of the valley. And no one's talking about public transportation or anything else. And then most of the people who drive to, through our town can't afford to live in Napa County. That's the big impact we need to make. It's getting these workers who, who have to drive so far from where they live to work. And we don't talk about that. When we tried to improve the flow of traffic through American Canyon by widening the highway, we didn't get support from Up Valley. We don't get that kind of support. But then when it comes down to the smallest, the smallest impact on the environment, everyone's jumping up and down. The cars idle all the way along every stoplight from here to Calistoga. I don't see outswell of that to change that. If we're going to impact the climate, we have to think bigger. If we're afraid of public transportation, if we're afraid to ride BART, if we're afraid of, of having high-speed rail or we don't want to pay for it, Banning leaf blowers and idling cars in a drive through is not going to make that impact. I respect every single one of the speakers who spoke. Uh, many of them are my friends. I support the youth. But I don't see this as the solution. I see it as a symbolic gesture to make some of us feel good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kenneth. I have a Jeanette. Good evening, everyone. Um, I just handed uh, petitions that we had signed, over 60 people signed it opposing the drive-through um, aspect of Chicken Guy restaurant. Um, my name is Jeanette Goyich. I'm from American Canyon. I oppose the drive-through. Um, I agree that a drive-through can be super convenient, but it is really important to recognize the hazards as well. When the topic of idling vehicles was brought to my attention, specifically related to drive-through restaurants, I was skeptical but became curious and started educating myself on this subject. Exhaust contains many pollutants that are linked to heart and lung diseases, along with many other health problems hurting children the most. I understand that some are thinking, what is the difference? One more drive through There are so many other environmental concerns. For example, the traffic on 29, which was just mentioned, is a huge problem. Well, the traffic along Broadway behind the restaurant could also become a very real traffic problem for the folks who live in that neighborhood. There is an argument that EV cars and trucks will be mandatory in a few years, so why be concerned about one drive through The problem is now and cannot wait till everyone has an EV car or cars that turn off when idling. Another argument I've heard is that Chicken Guy will employ people. How many will they be from American Canyon? or drive from elsewhere, causing further traffic congestion. I have no objection to the restaurant itself. There, there have been options presented, including sit-down restaurant, drive-up parking spots where you can order and shut off your engine and people will deliver your food. And there may be other ideas. For some, the drive-through fight seems silly and useless. I know, because that is what I've experienced when talking about this subject to people. There is so much to be concerned with when it comes to environmental issues. Having read the science, I know and understand that climate change is a climate crisis. Years ago, when we found out that plastics were a real problem, when you saw oceans and beaches covered like garbage dumps, putting people and animals at risk, recycling programs were adopted. The idea of recycling was started by a small group, group excuse me, of concerned citizens deciding to do something one thing at a time. My point here is that one plastic bag in an ocean of water, no problem. Millions of plastic bags 
in an ocean, a real problem and disaster. One drive through in a city, no problem. Many drive throughs is a problem. I'm thinking of the cumulative effect of toxic emissions of idling vehicles from drive throughs traffic on 29, idling trucks traveling to the warehouses, parents waiting for their children outside of schools. It all adds up. I ask that you consider dropping the drive through aspect. Am I done? Yes, please, please Thank you, wrap Jeanette. Up. I appreciate anyway, it. That's all, mostly what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. All right, please forgive me, but I do have a uh, speaker form with no name on it. All right. No, I have yours as well. One second. Hello, everybody. I'm Valerie Zizak Morais, President and CEO of the American Caribbean Chamber of Commerce. I'm here tonight to show uh, the Chamber of Commerce's support for the Chicken Guy Restaurant. Um, as you know, the Chamber is a nonprofit organization that supports local businesses. We are here to tell you the benefits of what we feel the, cha the Chicken Guy Restaurant will bring. We understand that as we continue to develop housing in our um, in our community that we need to develop business side by side. Otherwise, we're going to become an unbalanced city where we have nothing but houses and everyone within our community leaves the community to go and find um, food options, entertainment options, and recreation options. We know that there is a big environmental concern that comes along with this project, but if you take into consideration the amount of families that leave this community to go to other businesses outside of this region, the environmental impact is probably greater than the impact that this drive through will have here in American Canyon. Also the concern with the traffic, adding more cars on the road, not allowing people to use the services within their own community really cuts back on the fact that we have to continuously drive outside of our community to get these services. So for me, it's not just about do we want a restaurant, do we want a drive through We need a restaurant. I hear day in and day out that we need more food options, that people do not have places to go eat in American Canyon, that everybody is leaving town, spending their dollars in other areas. We want to keep our money within our city. We want to improve our city with the funding that comes in from new businesses. I'm here today to say, the Chicken Guy Restaurant has a place in our community. The, what they have put together for you is a great opportunity. There is seven of these restaurants in the United States. They picked American Canyon. We couldn't be more lucky to have this in our community. So the fact that they want to come here and we are giving them a hard time really upsets me as the Chamber CEO because we need business, we need good business, and we need people who want to come and develop this region. So. Thank you for hearing me tonight. We greatly appreciate the Planning Commission and all you do, and thank you from the bottom of our hearts. We hope that you plan, you approve this project tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie. Um, I have Yvonne. You know, I tend to jump right into things without addressing you all properly, so I'll do that now. Thank you, commissioners. Nice to see you all here today. Um, last March, when I was listening to the Chicken Guy developers tell us about their drive through and that it would have very little impact on the air in American Canyon, I wasn't sure what to believe. Then I heard their environmental analysts bring up data supporting their argument, but you know, I'm not the kind of person who's up to snuff on all this data and what it all means. So I did a little investigation on my own. Chicken Guy estimates there will be 988 cars going through that drive through every day. Wow, that's almost 1,000 cars a day. And since it will be the first Chicken Guy in all of Northern California, think of all the cars that will be coming in from other cities. We don't even have an estimate on how many cars will be local or driving in from Fairfield or Napa or Vallejo, and maybe even points further than that. So let's go with that estimate of 988 cars, and let's say that each car will idle for 10 minutes. Some more, some less, but an average of 10 minutes. In one month, we are talking about 29,460 cars. That's more than the entire population of American Canyon. And at 10 minutes each, that's 5,000 hours of idling. For every hour that a car idles, it uses up a half a gallon of fuel. One month, one drive through burns up a wasteful 2,500 gallons of gasoline, which contributes to 48,750 pounds of carbon into the air. Kind of makes you choke, doesn't it? A cumulative effect really does paint a different picture. And there are other drive throughs in American Canyon. There's six. 
There's 15 in Napa, and right down the street in Vallejo, there's even more. Now consider that we're already under a mandate to reduce our carbon emissions by 12% a year for the next eight years. This is statewide. What is American Canyon doing to cut back on carbon emissions? Instead, we're seeing the approval of more warehouses, commercial and residential development, contributing more, not less, to the global warming crisis, which all of you know is already at the tipping point for, and predicting a very dire future for our children. Now here's chicken guys wanting to open up their first drive through in American Canyon, and they have eight other drive throughs on the books. <coughs> Chicken Guys isn't getting the message that drive throughs well, they're dinosaurs now, aren't they? In this moment in time and space, we're questioning whether or not they're even going to be around in the next 10 years. In 2017, the fast food magazines were already predicting there was going to be resistance, and then COVID came and opened up new opportunities. Now, everyone's trying to build as many drive throughs as possible, knowing that window is going to close again. I suggest that American Canyon close the drive through window now. Thank you. Thank you, Yvonne. Do you have any more public comment? Beth? Yes, good evening, Beth Marcus. I feel bad for the chicken guy because they were approved back in 2018. And for us to keep saying they can't be here, we want to drive through, they don't want to drive through, we do have a, you know, I've spoke to a lot of our elderly people who, I, I, and let me first say that I am con concerned about emissions control as well. But we do have a lot of elderly people who in town don't want to get out of their cars. They want to go through the drive through Okay, so if they're saying 998 cars, they're not going to be 998 cars all at one time. It's going to be throughout the day. And I live here in American Canyon. I sit at the red lights for three to four minutes every day with my, I don't have a newer car, so I have emissions that are, you know, going out in the air. We're building more and more apartment buildings, which is gonna be more and more cars. There's gonna be more emissions. So I don't know why poor chicken guy is being uh, targeted for this. I just don't think it's right, because like Valerie said, there are so many uh, residents here in American Canyon who's always asking for more res for more restaurants. Finally, we get one. It's not a it's not really a sit down family restaurant type thing that we all would like to have a steakhouse or whatever, but it's another restaurant and it's another thing for us. I see us having more and more apartments being built rather than new businesses coming into town, and that sort of bothers me too. But I just think that it's it's a shame that the t chicken guy is getting criticized for all this when it had been approved way before our proclamation took place. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Final call for public comment. I'll go ahead and close public comment. Commissioners. Commissioner Altman. You don't want to save me for last? Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll <laughs> okay. You, so I've got a lot of comments after what we've heard. A lot of it is kind of rehashing what we've heard in the past and, and I think honestly kind of was unnecessary. Um, we're aware, we understand the uh, complaints, the issues with the drive through aspect. I think there were some other comments, however, and, and I want to give a special um, notice to uh, Ken Leary because I think his comments were particularly spot on that climate change is a much bigger issue than one drive through. I also want to um, give uh, some, some acknowledgement to uh, Beth Marcus and her comment which to me comes down to the equity question. Um, I'm a big believer in equity. And I think that while there are legitimate questions regarding the drive through, we are very unfairly treating the uh, developers of the Chicken Guy restaurant. Um,
if we as a community on a go forward basis, and I mentioned this in the past, want to pass a no drive through ordinance, cool, I may support that. But to do it retroactively on a project that this is being sprung on them after they've developed the project, I mean, if, if I'm a developer and this city is doing that, why would I want to develop anything in this community? Because I don't know what the rules of the road are and they can change on me at any time. I think it is, it is an extremely bad and dangerous precedent to set for us to say no to this project as it has been developed and presented over time. Um, I heard a comment about six drive-throughs in town. I'm aware of three. Uh, there's the coffee place, there's the Sonic, and there's Taco Bell. I don't know what the other three would be. Oh, Starbucks and Jack. Okay, okay, I missed two. Okay, so whoop, five. Okay, there we go. So, okay, clo closer than I thought. Um, but uh, I, I still don't think that the issue here, and, and, and I got to say on the broader scale, I don't think we're going to see a death of drive throughs And the reason I make that comment is 2030 is the year that's getting bandied about a lot. 2030, if I am recalling correctly, is the year that the state has mandated no more sales of internal combustion engine vehicles, ICEs. Mm -hmm. As a result, once new vehicle sales are restricted, it doesn't mean the ICEs are going to go away immediately, but let's assume a realistic timeline for an in internal combustion engine vehicle, and I think I'm actually extending this well beyond what the averages are, but I'm not an expert in this field, but if we even say 20 years, that means before 2050, we will have virtually no internal combustion engine vehicles on the road. We will have electric, or hopefully, better yet, we will have fuel cell. Because fuel cell, if you're really concerned about the environment, truly concerned, and not just looking to, as was uh, implied by some of the speakers, make a public statement, electric vehicles have received a lot of valid complaints about the energy costs in producing them in terms of the, the uh, batteries and, and all of the other factors. Fuel cell vehicles haven't received those kind of complaints. But we're not seeing the major push at the federal level, at the state level, at any level for fuel cell vehicles. So I, I, I look at all of this and I try and take an objective stance. And I've got two young kids. I've got a 15-year-old and a 12-year-old. So you bet I'm concerned in terms of the future of the climate and the future of, of our planet. But I also understand that City of American Canyon, State of California, country of the United States of America, no matter what efforts we make, if we're making them alone and the rest of the world isn't on board and similarly making efforts, the thing about climate, it's everywhere. It's not limited to just here. The climate in American Canyon doesn't just stay in American Canyon. It's impacted everywhere. So until we can get China, Russia, India, African countries, South American countries, other countries throughout Europe, throughout all the other regions in the world, throughout the Middle East, to start making real efforts, 
which the UN will tell you they're not, to a certain extent, we're fighting a fight with one arm tied behind our back. And I, and I just don't think, I, in closing, I'm gonna just kind of come back and, you know, we want food choices, we want, we, we have nothing that specializes in chicken in town. If you want, it, if you want a chicken sandwich, you gotta leave American Canyon. Got to go either up to Napa or down to uh, Vallejo. Nothing in town. Um, which adds to the driving, which adds to the emissions, which adds to idling vehicles. So when I look at this on the whole, it really comes down to the equity issue for me. And I just think that if we retroactively try to impose something on this applicant, it is exceptionally unfair and, and it turns my stomach. So that's kind of my comments, my thoughts. I appreciate it. Thank you, Commissioner Altman. Commissioner Goff. Thank you, Chair. Sorry. Thank you, Chair. Um, you know, this has been before us, this is our third time, fourth time. Um, and what I hear is the same, is the city is very, very concerned about um, greenhouse gas emissions, and they're looking at drive-throughs, and the main concern about drive-throughs is not the convenience of drive-through, they all love that, it's the idle time. Um, and we've talked about that, and a lot of information was presented to us about idle time. Um, what I think needs to happen here is the city um, needs to address that issue. Um, we have the climate emergency resolution. There need, just needs to be some clarity on that, on what we can do as a city to make a bigger impact. It's not Chicken Guy. It's everybody here. Um, so Chicken Guy's not at fault here. We just need to take action as a city, citywide. And an idling ordinance in the city would cover every drive through here, um, every place everybody stops, um, it's coming with vehicles, but we're a long way from that being common. Um, and the city can take action on this through an idling ordinance that will be citywide, and it will affect every drive through, and it will affect every person as they travel through our city. Um, and that is, I think, teeth in action. Um, so that's what I have to say on that matter. Everything else I've seen from Chicken Guy, community loves it. They want the food here. They want the opportunity for food here. Uh, a lot of comments about um, business in our community, restaurant, the balance between restaurants and housing. I agree with all of that. Um, I definitely agree with some of the comments that Beth made um, that part of this has been in motion for a very long time and changes universally have made it a little bit more of a tougher decision but I don't think Chicken Guy is the bad person here in any way, shape, or form. I just think our local government needs to take a little bit more stringent action when it comes to carbon emissions, greenhouse emissions throughout our city. Um, that's what I have, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Golf. I'd like to say a few words just, uh, in regards to the, the public comment uh, online and also in here, and just want to say thank you. Uh, this has been a strenuous, what I'd say, two, three months now in regards to just the chicken guy, and we're not going to win them all. And it's going to take, like uh, Commissioner Goff said, it's going to take the whole community, the city, the government, everyone around us to stand up and saying, hey, are we gonna create an ordinance for, like uh, Commissioner Altman said, no more drive-throughs, did so with the gas stations. I think this affects me the most if I believe I have the youngest ch children here, a four and an eight-year-old. Um, and we talked about this actually at the dinner table and they love it. One, because the fact that we have to always go to, to um, the one in Faleo constantly, I would love to walk 
to the chicken guy with my children in a wagon. I mean, it's going to take a long time, but I mean, I'd like to do that rather than get in the car, lug them in the, in the car seats, and drive 10 minutes just to fuel them with a waffle fries or such as that. Um, it's unfair and it's unfortunate that we are putting the developer in this position uh, at this moment, given the fact that it was well before, like it, Beth had mentioned in 2018, of a project of this stance. Um, I believe that there are other ways that we can improve on this. And I can personally say, as we begin to develop more homes, more families moving in, we need more businesses. We need a bigger grocery store. We need all of that. And if we're going to continuously say and put stop gaps for continuous growth here, um, we're not moving ourselves forward in the city. We're not growing. We're not being strategic enough to understand the growth that's needed here. I definitely understand the fact that we need to, we need to develop responsibly. But you have developers that are coming in that are wanting to be in American Canyon that are willing to help us grow and sustain here um, in, in, our, in our city. Um, but I definitely appreciate everyone's comments. I wish and encourage you to continue to participate and um, be part of, of the change. Thank you. Um, at this time, I'm looking for a recommendation from the commission. Yes, Chair Malari, I'd like to make a motion that we approve a resolution of the Planning Commission of the City of American Canyon, California, approving a conditional use permit for development of a 2,818 square foot quick serve restaurant with drive through at 200 American Canyon Road, APN 059-110-056, file number PL22-0021. I second. Roll call, please. Yeah. Oops, sorry. Yes. Commissioner Altman? Aye. Commissioner Goff? Aye. Commissioner Mohammed? Aye. Vice Chair Cruz? Aye. Chair Malari? Aye. Okay, moving on to next business uh, Bell Products Design Permit. Good evening, Planning Commission and members of the public. Uh, William He with the Planning uh, Division again. I'm here to talk about the Bell Products Warehouse Design Permit. Um, very exciting project as well. So um, I will give a uh, explanation of the location and uh, planning and zoning information. Uh, I'll share some site photos for the project, uh, their site plan. Uh, they only have one specific issue. We'll go over that and then I'll talk about staff's recommendation and the uh, CEQA compliance for the project. So here is the project. It's at 130 Dodd Court. Uh, interestingly, this uh, Dodd Court was developed around the 2000s, and this is the fifth and final project of Dodd Court. So we have FRG in the, in the north and uh, Lock and Union distilling in the, in the second building. Uh, I forgot what the, the building to the north of 130 Dodd is, but all those buildings were all developed except for this last one, this flag lot uh, at 130 Dodd Court. It's accessible from Paoli Loop Road uh, and, uh, and via Green Island Road. Here is the project information. Um, the project is in the green, uh, general industrial zone. It's a 2.828 acre site. The uh, warehouse is about 30,500 square feet. It also includes a 5,900 square foot outdoor covered area. It's a two-story warehouse and about 29 feet tall. Uh, the site includes 68 parking spaces, 
and uh, according to the, the developer, the business hours is going to be roughly 7 a.m. to 4 p.m., and they, they think that it's going to bring in about 25 full-time office jobs and 10 full-time shop jobs, so about 35 uh, employees overall. Uh, and, of course, the, the access is from Dodd Court. So here's the photos for the site. It's, it's a flag lot, so there's, uh, I wasn't able to, to get in there. Um, so the top uh, photo is the, uh, the entry, the T intersection from Paoli Loop and uh, Dodd Court. And then the bottom is when you're in Dodd Court, that's pretty much the frontage. That's the, the frontage to the entry. All right, here's their site plan. So um, 2.28 acres, the, uh, the warehouse in the middle in blue, um, that's the 30,000 uh, square foot warehouse. Um, the orange area is where the 5,900 square foot covered area is going to be. And more to the west, they have two bioretention uh, areas for uh, stormwater and, and, uh, and, and the rainwater as well. Um, and then their, their parking is shown in yellow there. So they have parking to the north, uh, to the east, and to the south. The, the, entry, the, the entry and exit is through the, shown in the red arrow the, um, uh, to the northeast. Um, they will have uh, a bike rack for five bike racks shown in the, uh, towards the entry of the site and one EV charger. And here is a rendering of the warehouse. So it is uh, uh, similar to, I think, if you guys remember the Wine Direct Warehouse, similar to that style, uh, two stories, um, uh, nice uh, open bay windows in the, the office section, and the colors are uh, three different types of gray. And we also have a rendering of what the rear section is, and that's the covered area, and that's also where they have their um, trash and recycling bins are. So. Um, it's, uh, it is covered and won't be seen. And here's their, their one site-specific issue, was, which is parking. That was probably the hardest part for this site. Um, uh, the uh, 30,000 square foot uh, parking is broken down into what uses they required. So there's the 10,000 square foot of office space uh, that required 35 parking spaces and then 20,000 square foot of warehouse that required 21 for a total of 66, and uh, they're providing 68. Um, some of the, the methods that they did to work in the parking was just use some uh, compact sites in, instead of standards. So uh, there's an allowance to do that. Um, and the site, as I mentioned, includes uh, five uh, bicycle parking spaces. Um, Lots of public outreach uh, for this uh, project. Um, it started in February when we posted the project on the site. We sent uh, our neighborhood letters, uh, 300 feet, and also um, uh, we've been uh, adding, uh, when we do these uh, public neighborhood letters, we always announce it in our gov delivery uh, email system. So, um, you know, about 3,000 people, 3,800 people have, have gotten notice of this. In, in the first outreach. Uh, and then we also uh, had our official public hearing notice in May 11th, and that's when it went to um, the property owners again, and also it was published in the uh, Vallejo Times Herald and also on our website. And lastly, it was uh, noticed, uh, at, oh, there's a reminder of the notice on the, the yesterday, in the day before the public meeting. Uh, throughout all that, we, we had uh, one comment. It was from a neighboring tenant, and the applicant responded to the commenter. Um, um, with that being said, uh, staff's recommendation is to approve this warehouse, helping to complete the Dodd Court warehouses. And uh, this project is uh, actually a categorically exempt project because it meets the CEQA section 15332. It's less than five acres and uh, a couple of other criteria that it meets. Um, so that's staff's recommendation. The applicant is here today. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free.
Does applicant have any words? Good evening, commissioners. Um, I'm Paul Irwin, president of Bell Products. With me this evening, um, Jeff Elkag and Gary Wipe, both my partners. Between the three of us, we're close to 100 years at Bell Products. In two years, we celebrate our 80th year as a contractor in Napa, in Napa County. So uh, we're here for the long haul. We've owned this property for about 25 years, and it's always been our go-to, and we're excited to be ready to go to now. Uh, it's a great location. Uh, we look forward to being in American Canyon, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you would have. So. Thank you. Before we proceed with the uh, commissioner comments, I'll go ahead and open up public comment. Do we have any public comment for in person? Okay. Is there anyone on Zoom who would like to comment on this item? Please raise your hand at this time. Okay, no public comment. Thank you, Nicole. Go ahead and pl close public comment. Commissioners? We'll start down on this side. Commissioner Mohammed? No comment? Okay. Commissioner Golf? Yeah, thank you. Um, actually, I just really have one question. Um, just by looking at the little map there, and I saw one sad little EV charger. Um, based on the previous discussions we just kind of had in relation to uh, admissions, um, my suggestion would be maybe a few more EV chargers on the property possibly and maybe possibly some solar on the roof to offset the charge of those EV chargers. Um, just thinking that way. But that's all I got. Otherwise, thank you. Sure. Well, just a suggestion. It wasn't a question. <laughs> well, could you please go to the podium to so to that we can pick you up? Thank you. And Thanks, state Paul. your name for the record. Sure. It's Paul Irwin, again, yeah. Um, most all our office vehicles are hybrid, and we see our fleet being uh, electric at some point in time. Most all our vehicles take their vehicles home. Rarely is a vehicle there overnight. So I think that, yeah, more charges would be appropriate, but with our vehicles, uh, we are transitioning to hybrids and electrics, so as they come available, so. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Altman. I'll ask one quick question. So you may want to come back because I just think <laughs> you'll have a very quick answer for me as well, uh, <laughs> which is, as I understand your business, you're a service business and you send technicians out to work generally at businesses or people's homes on their mechanical systems. Correct. So you don't really have people coming and visiting you. You just have employees parking. So, and, and I'm asking relative to what William pointed out with the parking where you've basically got 35 people, you know, um, coming uh, and we've got not that many more available parking spaces. So I just, you know, want to verify that you're not a place where you're expecting 20 people to show up and want to come in, in and shop. Correct, yeah. There's no retail component to our operation. There, there we go. So, uh, and so the if there's a company vehicle sitting there, we're not making any money. Right. So we want them to be out on the job sites. So, yep. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I told you it would be pretty easy. It, it was. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Commissioner Cruz, you good? I'm good. We're, we're good. Thank you. I do welcome you to come up come more to American Canyon, but uh, thank you. No, no further comment. Okay. Thank you. I just have one. Um, just in regards to the uh, potentially the 35 jobs, full-time employees, how does the out, outreach um, pertain in, you know, in regards to uh, filling those positions? Is that, yes. Please, Paul. Is that something that we do out um, you've already have selected or kind of a pool of employees? We have those 35 employees. We're in operation in downtown Napa right now, and we'll move everybody to American Canyon. So 
if that answers your question. Yes. So. Yeah. So there would be okay. So no, no new positions essentially or opportunities. Probably not. But there's all there's new positions every year that we go through. And and for our craftspeople, we're union, so we hire through the hiring hall. Got it. Uh, and then for our non-signatory employees, we'll search through uh, um, uh, employment services or you know, regular out outreach for, uh, for Napa area. Mm -hmm. Most all our employees live within Napa County. You know, we're kind of Napa based. Most of our work is in Napa, but we still do a lot of work in surrounding counties, so. Is there an opportunity, um, is, there, is that also a, a training component or an aspect in that facility as well? There is for the non-signatory employees, for the office staff and maybe warehouse people, certainly there would be, yes. Okay. So curious just kind of thinking of uh, other opportunities for uh, our students here just for field trips and you know looking at different trades certainly yeah. and, and we we always have yearly interns that we usually high school kids during summer we have interns you know that intern with us uh, in Napa uh -huh. we would be continuing doing that that's a standard and we actually have always obtained really great employees through those interns so that's uh, the outreach is kind of constant and pretty thorough Thank you, I appreciate it. I'm staying right here. Oh, all right. Well, I have no further. Oh, all right, Commissioner Altman. If I can just follow on Certainly. that line of questioning for just a moment. Um, you mentioned the employees are all within county. Do you most have, all, most right, all. Do you have any idea as to how many are actually American Canyon versus anywhere else? I, I don't. Okay. I, don't. I wasn't prepared for that. Okay. Yeah, so. All right, I am not seeing any comments from the commissioners. I'll go ahead and look for a recommendation, commissioners. I'll go ahead and recommend that we approve a, a resolution of the Planning Commission of the City of American Canyon, California, approving the design permit for a 30,544 square foot two-story warehouse in the General Indus Industrial Zoning District at 130 Dodd Court, APN 057-160-014, file number PL220037. I second that motion. Roll call, please, Nicole. Yes, Commissioner Goff. Aye. Commissioner Altman. Aye. Commissioner Muhammad. Aye. Vice Chair Cruz. Aye. Chair Malari. Aye. This may be a moment or two early, but welcome to American Canyon. <laughs> All right. Following the order of business, we'll go ahead and move on to the NVRG Curry Lake and Fig Tree Amphitheater conditional permit. <laughs> no, that's only because I dry, dry ran it a few times. Uh, good evening, uh, good evening, Chairman Malari and fellow commissioners. Uh, I'm Terrence McGrath of, of Watson Ranch, uh, Napa Valley Ruins and Gardens, and Hotel at the Ruins. Thank you for having me here tonight. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to acknowledge. Uh, oh, they left the room. Uh, <laughs> Jeff Yeager, who's been with me from the very beginning on this project, and the Yeager family, along with his son-in-law, Nate Heidorf, who um, uh, is married to Jeff's daughter, Alex, Jeff and Chris's daughter, and then Salvador Ramos, who <laughs> is, uh, is, as he knows, um, a person that I have the utmost love and respect for, because not only for him as a human being, but everything he does for us every day uh, very unselfishly in helping us continue to move through the project and solve issues that come up that you know some of the most uh, skilled consultants in the world can't solve so thank you Salvador no just this is Jeff Yeager who I just acknowledged he walked out um, anyway this is a little bit of an unusual presentation because um, it's a very technical project uh, it's probably in my four decades of doing this, probably 
one of the most technical projects I've ever worked on, specifically the amphitheaters. Um, and I'll get into it in just a minute, but uh, I'm gonna also do something a little bit different just so you don't get sick of listening to me talk about different things. Um, four of the different consultants are gonna take on different segments of this and they're all on Zoom and some of them are on different time zones right now. So we're gonna try to get into this very quickly. Um, but I'm gonna kind of take a first crack at this. You can see this, this is the uh, outline we're gonna go through is just show you who the design team is and then the existing canvas as it sets today, a quick overview of the existing site plan for the ruins and hotel, obviously get into the ruins and then do the design presentation on the two amphitheaters, and then we'll get into the sound study and then the traffic slash trip generation and then move to conclusion and Q&A. So hopefully we can get through this pretty quickly. So obviously I'm not gonna go through all these, but you can see um, number two, Balance Hydrologic has been with me 20 years. Um, Bollard has done several sound studies for us over the last, um, God, it's probably getting close to now, seven or eight years. CBG, the civil engineering team, have been with me for almost 25 years. Um, uh, ECS is my construction manager, project manager. Roger's been, been with me, working with me for over 20 years. Farron Piers, well known in the world of traffic, um, both on the private and, and public agency side. They've also been doing our, our stuff uh, for multiple decades. PACE is um, working with Balance on our storm uh, detention, retention, because we're doing some really interesting things out there from a sustainability perspective. Um, one of the things that you'll start to see here very shortly is um, we're just putting up the, the fence along Rio del Mar. Um, you'll, you'll see it over the next couple of weeks. You can see some of the sections going up. That's all wood that is remilled from the glass fire um, and from dead and burnt trees. And then Perkins Will, they're a new member to the team. They started on this project in February. Uh, they are a very large uh, architectural concern, I think, globally. Um, the group in Denver that's handling this project that is on a different time zone, they, their expertise in, this, in uh, designing, um, permitting amphitheaters, uh, arenas, stadiums, um, just like this and just they're doing very, very large projects. They have an incredible track record, uh, but again, bring great expertise to the team. And then the final group is uh, WJHW, and they are, um, they're the group that actually designs the actual sound system, the, the real sound system. So all of this was done digitally so that you can manipulate both the actual architectural drawings, you can, you can manipulate sound down to the speaker types, to the type of frequencies. And we've probably done, I, my guess is, in excess of 40 or 50 different models in, in tweaking the sound. And what's a little bit unusual about this is that it actually has the sound system designed into it. And I would say that most projects like this that get approved there's, first of all, there's very rare that you're seeing an amphitheater approved. I don't think there's been one, you know, I would say Concord Pavilion is a recent one, Mountain View um, or Shoreline's a recent one, but then you start moving past that and you're getting to probably a half a century to a century before one has been, you know, approved and built in California. But it's very unusual where your actual sound system that the different acts are gonna use is actually designed into this. So that's what, that's what the group on number eight does. So I am going to shift out of here for a second and just give you um, kind of a quick overview of where we are today. This is a drone 360, we shoot it every week. So we've been doing this now for up to two years. And I'm just gonna kind of walk you around the project. I think it's probably a week to 10 days old, something like that. Yeah, you can see, so this is the hotel site that you just approved here. So I'm looking due east. That's Newell Open Space. Newell Property is here. This is Mallon Way. You can see our construction trailer sitting up on top of that hill there. Um, so the idea is, you know, we move the hotel down lower and essentially you can park your car. All the cars are gonna get parked over here per the approvals. And then you can walk down the stairs across the speed table and into the project. Um, this is sort of looking northeast. We just planted all these very large olive trees down the medium 
And I was out there on Monday actually making sure they were all level and nice and straight and everything else. Um, we just sold these 40 lots to DR Horton up here on the top end. And again, this is, this is where the vine trail sort of parallels the project right there. Um, these are 40, 40 homes or 40 finished lots that we sold DR Horton in October. They're moving the sales office over there shortly. You can see the solar panels on the roof and they've started selling these homes. This is Lemos Point, and you can see they've just, they've just finished the cladding, the actual skin on the first two pods as well as the roofs. And this little piece here will be, I think, finished in the next uh, week or so. Um, and that, I think, is still scheduled for July 1st for occupancy. And then I can kind of take you over the top of the ruins of what we're going to talk about. This is the small amphitheater. We'll go right in here. And then um, this will be where the large lamp amphitheater, the Quarry Lake Amphitheater that we're proposing, and that's inside of the actual, you know, leftover quarry, the old bowl that was formed when they were uh, quarrying limestone and clay to make uh, cement in the late 1800s, early 1900s. So I am going to X out of there and then get back to my presentation. So this is, uh, we're going to quickly show you an overall site plan of both the ruins and the hotel because I think it helps to kind of, because of the scale of this, it really helps to continue to sort of show everybody how it all ties together. And one of the things that you'll see throughout this is the idea behind this is you sort of park your car once and, and, and you know, to some of the, the Climate Now people that were on the phone earlier or on Zoom earlier, the idea behind this is that one trip shares a whole bunch of uses. And I understand where they're coming from. If you look at the way that the, the wine country is used today, if you look at the top 15 or 20 activities that the average tourist uses, they're all remote, meaning you go to the restaurant for dinner, then you drive from the restaurant you know, or for lunch, then you drive from the restaurant to the winery, then from the winery to the hotel, and so on and so forth. The idea behind the ruins has always been Essentially, you can, you can get there once and experience all these things essentially that, that, that the average tourist uses in the Napa Valley or the wine country. You can experience them all over here, including things like mountain bike riding that, that again, you can never have to get in your car. So with that said, I'm going to have CBG. I don't know if it's Will or Jason um, walk you guys through the site plan. Um, Will, Jason? Jason. Hey, Terry. Hey. Hey, it's, it's Will Carlson from CBG. Thanks for having me on uh, this evening. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm going to just run you through the site plan real quick and point out a couple of uh, different items. So I'm going to first go through um, just some of the points of interest on the site. So um, at the corner uh, southeast intersection of Rio del Mar and Rolling Hills Drive, that's uh, where the hotel is that Terry pointed out uh, just a minute ago. Um, the private residences that are sitting uh, perched up above the hotel as well. So there's the two two tiers of homes that are sitting up on the on the hotel hill as well. Um, on the west side of Rolling Hills Drive, we have the core, which is the Napa Valley Ruins and Garden. Um, the two amphitheaters, the Fig Tree Amphitheater, which is on the eastern side of the Ruins and Gardens there, and then the Quarry Lake Amphitheater, which is right at, uh, nestled down at the southeast corner of the Ruins and Gardens and the corner of Rolling Hills Drive. And you can see that that a parking is sort of spread. The idea is that you have parking for, for the hotel, you have overflow parking for the ruins as well, you have overflow parking here, you have both parallel parking and diagonal parking along Rio del Mar. Um, as well as a very large parking field here that's coming off of South Napa Junction. Um, that is one of the main lots. And then there's some additional parking sort of on the access roads coming into it. Yeah, that, that's correct, Terry. Yeah, there's, there's kind of just parking situated in, in all directions, like you're saying, to help with um, pedestrian path, uh, path of travel and just for um, access as well. We also have an extensive EVA system, the emergency vehicle access system, that you can kind of see, it's, it's, 
obviously can be used for both pedestrians and EVA, but it's sort of highlighted here in the blue dots. And this is obviously a critical aspect of not only the ruins, the hotel, but the amphitheaters, because obviously EMS and fire play a very critical role on being able to circulate throughout the whole project. And all of these various things connect through to the main roads of Mallon, Rio, Rolling Hills, and South Napa Junction. Anything else yet you, you want to add there, Will? Um, I, I think just for maybe pedestrian path of travel, Terry, yeah, the, that blue kind of yeah, dashed line that you're seeing is the path of travel. So it's kind of, you know, uh, there's great um, pedestrian uh, access throughout the site up Mallon Way, um, along Rolling Hills Drive, Rio Del Mar, uh, throughout the hotel and residences and through the ruins and gardens. They also connect down to the lot 14 and 15 subdivision and down south to the existing neighborhoods. Yeah, these streets have bollards at the end of them. So essentially you can't get a car through there. You can get you can get fire or police or EMS through there, but essentially they're meant to be walk streets that then connect to the to the backside of the of the ruins and the quarry lake. Yeah, I think then the other item to mention too, Terry, is just trails. On the west side of Mallon Way, there's the Vine Trail, which is existing that was just constructed. On the south side of uh, Rio Del Mar, there's the River to Ridge Trail, which was just constructed as well. Um, and those will connect to uh, the future, the future uh, re, uh, river to ridge will extend east and west. And then the vine trail will also extend to north in the future when the new property develops. So at the um, intersection of Mallon and Rio Del Mar, that's the intersection of the river to ridge and uh, Napa vine trail. Yeah, just to put it in perspective, I think we might have talked a little bit about this when we did the hotel um, uh, presentation to you. I think Yontville, between Yontville and Napa in 2021, did 175,000 unique uh, trips, walking and, and bike. So this ultimately will be a really big access to the project by either walking or biking. Anything else, Will? I think just maybe uh, last item to talk about, Terry, is maybe the elevation of the site and just the topography. Right. So just to kind of remind everyone of the situation vertically. So maybe going from highest to lowest um, at the top of the hotel hill, that elevation is around elevation 170. The elevation of the residential units um, at the hotel is elevation 150, so about 20 feet below. The hotel is going to sit at elevation 120, so about 30 feet below the residences. Rolling Hills Drive is at elevation 110, 10 feet below the hotel. The Ruins and Gardens is elevation 100, 10 feet below Rolling Hills Drive. And then the Quarry Lake Amphitheater will sit at elevation 70, which is about 30 feet below the Ruins and Gardens and 40 feet below Rolling Hills Drive. The water surface in Quarry Lake will be approximately five feet lower than the Quarry Lake Amphitheater. And then you're moving all the way down to grade here, what, at about 70, 75, Will? That's correct. So the idea, just to kind of put this in context, it's really about stair-stepping it down so that you can, you know, from the hotel lobby, you've dropped your car, you've walked through the lobby, you're standing on the deck, and essentially you're looking at the bay and the horizon, but you're also looking down potentially, you know, over the top of the amphitheater as well as over the top of the ruins. So it's, it's, a, it's all interlinked, and we've spent a lot of time in the field working on the topography. Anything else, Will? I think that's pretty much it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So quickly on the ruins, you know, again, a lot of you have heard this, but there's, there's these key components to it. There's activities, you know, events, entertainment, skate parks, climbing walls, you know, farmer's market. I mean, there's all these different activities. But then there's also the key elements of art beverage, food, and music. And so those four have always been a really big part of that along with the hospitality. Um, and again, coming back to one trip, whether you've, you've walked there, you've ridden there, you've, you've driven there, you've ride shared there, you've taken the bus there, this all interconnects. And so all of these uses exist on the same canvas and again, in order to sort of shorten this presentation, we eliminated a bunch of slides. But if you look at what Napa Valley um, tourism does every year, 
they model all the things that tourists do when they're up here, and every single one of these are on this canvas. So it's a really, really powerful statement to um, less trips, frankly. Um, we're going to get into so site plan. These are all the specific uses that we've that we've continued to evolve, um, and I'm going to highlight just a. Uh, a couple of these just because some of these are new and sort of shows you our continuing commitment to the ruins besides everything else we're doing on the alcohol beverages side of it um, I just purchased a controlling interest of a brewery based in Oakland they've been in operation 20 years and we are going to uh, establish a second brewery second tasting room inside the ruins and this is the existing name is old can and actually they are in a form, I met them because of a building that I owned in Jack London next to where the A's were purportedly going for the last decade and now not. But um, they're going to be a key component on the beer side. Um, as some of you know, uh, I bought um, Lock and Union Distillery at the end of December. It's on Dodd Court. It's just one building away from the one that you just approved. And uh, what's interesting about that world Besides the fact that it's a fully operation this distillery that ultimately will move on to into the ruins in a couple of years, it also included 350 barrels of what is now an American defined classification, which is American single malt whiskey. And they've been laying that product down since I think 2017, 2018. So we've just started blending that, that first product and we actually had a blind tasting last week. So that's another key element of this. And then the, the sort of last piece of the, the triumvirate is the wine side of the business. Um, I've, I've formed a joint venture with a group, and we will produce all our, we'll, we will, ne I should be careful saying never. We won't grow our own grapes, but we'll buy a lot of existing juice, not only in Napa, but Sonoma, but other surrounding counties in California to make wine that is produced and labeled with Ruins Wine Company. And interesting kind of piece that we're working on for this is we plan on using one of the pieces of art each year for the red and one of the pieces of art for the white and give a percentage of that back into the art community. But it's also something that helps tell a really simple story because it's true. None of this is fabricated. These are all pieces that somebody has come out there and, and, and painted. Um, so I think in the end, it's gonna be a very, very powerful, powerful statement, not only in terms of, of what we're doing on site, but also to our commitment to giving back to the community. So uh, before the PW team gets going, this is the Google Earth shot of this. And again, like I said, you know, this is a, this is a sizable quarry. There were originally seven of them on site and they were formed because they quarried them um, and excavated all the limestone and clay out of them. This is the last of the remaining ones. And I started working on the concept of an amphitheater probably over 15 years ago. And originally, I had, it, I had it down here, and I wanted to carve it into the, into the limestone and clay cliffs down there, but it just simply was not possible. And as time went on, we played with, you know, an iteration down here. And eventually it was like, oh my God, the light, the light went off. It's like, oh my God, there's a perfect bowl down here. And you'll see when, when Don and Brian get into the presentation. But one thing I do want to point out is, and they'll get into this more specifically, but we're going to raise the shoulder of this back shoulder. But there will be a an access to the public. So even when there's an event, the public will be able to, like, and some of you may have seen this at, at Cal football. There's a, there's a place above the stadium they call Tightwad Hill. And you can basically watch the game for free. I mean, you're fairly high up and a long ways from the playing field, but you get to kind of experience the big crowd. This will be somewhat similar. You know, you won't be able to actually see the front of the music venue that's taking place there, but you'll be able to picnic and have and listen to music that is built into this back edge of the shoulder of the Cory Lake. And with that, I am going to let, uh, this is uh, looking if, if I was standing on the stage and looking over my shoulder, that's what you'll see when you're standing on the stage. And then this is across the shoulder 
the space I just talked about, looking back towards the ruins themselves. So with that, um, go ahead, Don and Brian. It's all yours. Okay. Yeah, can you guys hear me okay? By the way, this is way past Don's bedtime. He's in, he's in Denver, and so uh, I apologize. No, no, no. I go to bed later. It's only nine. <laughs> so yeah, uh, great. Thanks, Terry. Uh, so as Terry said, uh, we specialize in the design of amphitheaters and entertainment venues and arenas. So we're really excited about this project. It has a very unusual and wonderful location, uh, which we think makes it really unique. So again, as Terry said, there is a natural bowl. Uh, North is up on, the, on all the drawings I'm gonna be showing. So here's the natural bowl. It's a little overgrown now, but um, as he said, the hill on the south side, which is to the left, is much greener and more shallow. And then to the right, you get more of a cliff. So what we've kind of based this on is a traditional Greek amphitheater, which you'll see in just a second. Uh, and then I think if you go out there now, you're seeing the actual height of where the lake will be because of with all of your rain, it has gone up this year. And so we're planning that. And our stage, as uh, Will said, will be about five feet above the water. Next. So a little hard to see here, but the idea was uh, looking at the site plan and we'll, we'll zoom in with uh, plans in um, just a second, but it's really oriented. So the, the crowd centers, overlooks the stage and it is on axis with the total length of the lake and then the West Hill beyond. Um, and then the other thing you're starting to see is there's a two, uh, little road that is connecting from the south up on the hill and it goes east or a little northeast down to the stage level. That's very important both for emergency access for vehicles, uh, fire uh, engines, as well as loading the amphitheater. So we have a single 24 foot road going down there. Trucks can turn around and then go back up. So this plan, what you're starting to see is this is the lowest level. And unlike probably most plans you're seeing, this doesn't look like much right here because on the right where it's kind of whiter gray, that's where we're really built into the hill. So what we have is the road coming from the west, the access road. We have an elevated stage of about four feet. Trucks can turn around. The big line behind the stage, the idea is that we are going to have large movable panels. So people can either be looking at the lake or through the stage and overlook the lake, or if a certain act wants to come and wants, for instance, wants a big video board right behind them on the stage, we can close the panels and they can do that. And then as Terry has also pointed out to us, depending on the weather, the wind can pick up off the bay a little bit. So that also allows us to close the wind down if we need to, to create comfortable conditions. The other thing you're seeing down here is the kind of slightly orange tan building to the south of the stage, which is down below the stage, are the changing rooms for the acts that will be using them. And then we also down on this level, right at the front of all the seating, we have additional concessions and restrooms that the people down front can use. And if you remember, what we said is we've got the lake level, then the stage level up five feet. And now we're gonna go up and show you upper plans. And there's about a 40 foot drop from the very top of this amphitheater uh, down to the front. So the next plan we'll take you through is this is about halfway up the amphitheater. And what we have here is a cross aisle that goes around. So you'll be able to go from the, you're basically going to enter the amphitheater at the top, the public will. They will be able to go down the upper bowl, hit a cross aisle, and then go down to the lower. At the very top, there's two squares with little X's up there on the north side or up on this plan. We have two elevators that are going to take people who need to use an elevator instead of walk an aisle including wheelchairs and their companions. So we will have wheelchair and ADA seating right down in front of the stage uh, at the lowest level. We will have wheelchair seating at the cross aisle and dispersed horizontally so you can pick uh, and choose where you wanna sit. And then we will also have ADA and wheelchair companion seating at the very top of the concourse. 
The other thing you're seeing in the brightly colored at the top and the bottom are again, concessions, bars, and restrooms. So if you are seated near the cross aisle, you can use those restrooms. If you're seated below, you use the lower ones. And if you're seated at the top, you use restrooms up on the concourse level. So we'll take you up to the concourse level. So I'm doing this a little backwards because we're doing it for the topography. But quite honestly, this is the level virtually everyone is going to see because we are coming in at the top of this amphitheater and then we people will walk down to the stage. As Terry said, we want them to kind of have a one-stop visit here. So what we're planning is that the major entry to the amphitheater, there will be exits all the way around. So we have a safe situation, but the major entry is going to be on the north side, which is the top of this drawing and that directly faces the ruins. So the goal is it helps traffic a lot, it helps use. If we can get people there in advance and they're going to restaurants, they're seeing the art, they're visiting some of these food and beverage choices, then they come over and enjoy the amphitheater. That's why we have put the main entry on the north. The kind of yellow tan area is a large concourse that goes all the way along the top. So the features we're showing is over on the upper left are the where you hit the two elevators and you're able to go all the way down to the stage level. Then you see the concourse in kind of yellow. Uh, the building on the upper right is a series of food and beverage concessions as well as really large restrooms. And then we have an area that's much larger than the rest of the concourse. So the idea there is we'll have tables and chairs, dining, people can hang out, uh, et cetera. And then the uh, concourse goes around. About just a little south of due east, there's a little white box. If you're wondering what that is, that is the current transformers are out on the sidewalk. So we're not moving those, we are working around those. And approximately from that white box, which is just a little southeast, all the way around to the south, what we have come up with is a wall on the outside. It will be landscaped between the sidewalk and it. It's about 15 feet tall. And then we have a sloped roof that will extend up. Um, and so the sloped roof and the wall do two things. They stop sound from going out from the amphitheater towards the nearby residential uh, houses. Uh, and they also will have absorptive surfaces on the underside of the canopy, as well as the inside of the, or the amphitheater side of the wall to help absorb sound. So right now we have sized that based on the sound study that we've been getting. But if this is, a, as this is approved, if we go ahead, we will then really design this in detail as we continue on designing the sound system and looking at uh, you know, the final design of this. One other thing the covered concourse at the top does do, if it ever starts raining uh, while during a concert, it allows people to gather underneath that and get out of the rain, especially if it's something like raining for 20 minutes. Uh, we found that's very effective uh, in an amphitheater. So this is a rendering of what it would look like kind of center at the top concourse, looking down on the stage, uh, the kind of cube to the right is the elevators. You can see part of the ruined uh, above it with kind of the slope round roof. Uh, and so we have really a semicircle we're creating. It's very intimate. The last row is only about 115 feet from the front of the stage. So uh, this is a nice project. We in the business, we would call this a smaller amphitheater. The way we classify them uh, is you know z zero to like four thousand is what we would call the smaller uh, for for large acts, and then four to uh, like twelve is midsize, and twelve and above like shoreline are the really big ones, which are a different kind of venue and you know attract far more people than this will. Uh, the goal here is to really create great acts close in to the performer and really create. Uh, an intimate environment, but also where you can see the great natural setting, because there's very few settings that amphitheaters have this. This is very unique, and, and we want to uh, you know, make use of the Great Lake 
and uh, all the hills surrounding it, as well as the ruins. Hey, Don, let me just jump in here for a second. So one of the things, if you think about this design, and you know, probably most of you, if not all of you, have either seen a show outdoors at one of the amphitheaters around Northern California or in the U.S., or gone to like Chase or something like that. The unique thing about this is, and this comes from my own um, predisposition to, if I'm going to do this, I want to do it right. So the seats are 22 inches wide. So I've been to the Greek a ton of times and the fog's blowing in and I'm sitting on concrete. It's incredibly uncomfortable. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a long ways from the stage. And so the, the, what Don had mentioned about the furthest seat is about 110, 115 feet from the stage. Seats are 22 inches wide. The rise from, from seat to seat is 14 inches. So someone very tall could be sitting in front of you and you can still see the stage. And that's the beautiful thing about the amphitheater design. The other thing that I love about this that I've spent a lot of time on is the acoustics. And if you think about what Oxbow does with their concerts in that retaining basin or detention basin, essentially there's no acoustics to those sound. And depending on how windy it is, um, you know, the sound can really vary from okay to not very good. And just a, a quick side note, I'm not going to name, name the act, but a friend of mine knew one of the acts there that played there this summer, and I asked her, hey, would you mind going backstage after the concert and, and ask him what he thought? And so there's a picture of her and him, and the quote underneath is, it felt like I was playing in a Home Depot, Wendy Home Depot parking lot. And so to me, not only is this experience about you as the, the user of this, but it's also about the act. And the acts have to be comfortable. They want to come to a place that's really unique. And as Don mentioned, this has got sort of a Hollywood Bowl, Red Rocks. I mean, this is a very, very, very special topographical, geographical design, but it's natural. I mean, essentially, we're, we're virtually doing nothing to that bowl that was not already done 130 years ago. So um, anything else, Don, you want to add? No, I think that's fine on the quarry. And then I think we can... Oh, so yeah, so we did do some 3Ds to make it easier to see. So this is from the south side with the wall drawn behind the stage, looking down at the side of the stage. And then here, as Terry just said, we don't have any just bleachers without any backs. These are all individual seats for comfort. Uh, looking at the opposite then um, from the other side. And you can see you can see the sound mitigation wall that's designed into the back there. So you can see the, the canopy over the stage, but then to the left of it, you can see that that capturing sound to the, to the east and the southeast that would potentially drift into Vintage Ranch. And the south slope that you're seeing on the right here, the I didn't mention that and you'll hear it in the sound study, but the idea is to make use of that hill and, and hill it up further. So it's a taller deal to stop the sound going from the houses that are on the right. So we go from that cover to a natural berm. Here we are up on the concourse on the south side underneath the canopy part. So again, that underside will be an absorptive surface, as will that inside wall that you're seeing to the right to not only stop the sound from going from the residential, but to also suck it up inside so we maintain really good acoustics inside the amphitheater. And then this is the view the stage people would get looking straight up to the amphitheater with it wrapping around you on both the left and the right. So that was the Quarry Lake Amphitheater. And then when Terry has set this up before, he actually did an event, and you might want to talk about that first, Terry, sure. uh, so, about how you had a special event in this one spot, and it just seemed like a perfect, really small amphitheater for super intimate events. So again, just you know, in thinking about this over the last decade and a half, I paid a lot of attention to sound. And this particular building, the Fig Tree Amphitheater, just has perfect acoustics. It's just crazy. So uh, last fall, last fall, last summer, um, the Alive, uh, which have played at Bottle Rock several times, and it's 
I think the oldest kid is like 18 or something like that. It's incredible. Anyway, they wanted to do a video shoot in the ruins. And so the trade was that in, in doing the video shoot, I wanted them to just test out sound inside this small fig tree amphitheater. And, you know, these are kids. They're, they're teenagers. Like one is 14, one is 17, one's 18 or something like that. And they've been out there, you know, and one forgets his drumsticks, one forgets the amp. I mean, it's just classic, you know, you know, teenagers, even though they're professionals. So it's four or five hours into it, and they're like, nah, we don't really want to do it. And I had built a temporary stage with a canopy inside of the fig tree because I wanted to test the sound. Finally, you know, Nate and Jeff Whitman co coaxed them into coming out there. And so they're sitting there, and you can tell they're just dead tired. Anyway, one kid starts to, you know, the drummer starts to just mess around on the drums a little bit, and all of a sudden he's like, whoa. And he turns to the other two and he goes, did you hear that? They're like, yeah, I would come out here every day just to practice and jam. And so this is with no amplifiers or anything like that. So my vision of this has always been unlike the large amphitheater, the Quarry Lake Amphitheater. This is sort of harkens back to, you know, the days where bands went from small venue to small venue by bus. And the design of this is essentially, this isn't fixed seating. It has a capacity of about 800, but you could also take it all the way down to 200 with you know, tables and chairs and a very intimate you know, dinner slash event there. And so as much as I love the Quarry Lake, I think this one probably will resonate more with the acoustical side of the business where you Simply, you could play there and not even have to amplify music. So with that said, I'll let you go ahead and take it over, Don. Yeah, so there it is circled on the plan. That's what you see right now. This is on the east side facing west. And so what you get is a huge wall on the west, which is the one right in the middle, a huge wall on the north. There used to be a huge wall on the south, and only part of it returns now, and the rest was just pushed over. So what we're trying to do is reuse some of these concrete as kind of terrace pavers and steps, but also we need to make sure we have changing rooms for the acts. So right backstage, when you see the plan here, that those are existing big, thick concrete walls, those big black lines. So as you can see on the plan, the south does not come out as far as the north wall, but both of them wrap the stage, which is the area on the left, which is kind of in gray. It's raised slightly because we want to keep it intimate and not overdo it. But then the blue room and then the yellowish room to the left are changing rooms with restrooms. So we can have one or two acts or one act in a green room. And then the idea, as Terry said, is we would not on this one do fixed seating. We have treads and risers that go north, south and would just step up. We have a flat part of the floor that starts for a little bit and then the treads and risers rise up. But the idea is we would have movable chairs. So we could either have a scenario where we have a center aisle, what I call the wedding setup, um, where you, people march down the center, or this setup here where we have a uh, center seating section and an aisle to one side uh, above the center and below the center. And then at the top, we would have ADA or wheelchair seating right down in front of the stage, as well as at the top. And then we would have a mixing um, and spotlight platform, which is kind of the lavender area that is slightly L-shaped. Again, where there's big thick walls, that's already a big elevated concrete uh, abutment that is already there that we're making use of. And then the idea is on the surroundings, top and bottom, we would just use some of the crushed concrete or the broken concrete to create paving where we can put uh, hospitality tables and chairs at the north edge, the east edge, and the south edge of this small intimate amphitheater. So this shows you a section not nearly as steep as the Quarry Lake. The idea is we would cover the stage because we always have to be prepared against rain. Uh, you can see the locker rooms behind it. Those big, thick walls just stick up, and then we create locker rooms in there. Uh, and then at the top is really not that vertically tall, but again, another really intimate venue and unique because of these big concrete walls. 
So here it would be, again, we haven't fully rendered this for right now, it's black and white. But again, you have two doors coming from the backstage, the changing rooms, you see the seats. And again, those are movable seats with two aisles or we have a one aisle configuration down the middle. And then as you're at the top here, you'd be looking not only at the stage, but there is no wall to the south, which is to the left. So you could just pivot your head and you see the, less, uh, the rest of the ruins and hospitality right to the left. And there'll be also more to the north, which is to the right. And that, I think. Perfect. That's awesome. Thank yeah. you, Don. Well done. Um, we're going to shift into now the acoustical study. So uh, as I mentioned, Bollard Acoustical in conjunction with WJHW, uh, who did the actual sound system design. And I'll just set the stage and I'll turn this over to Paul Bollard. And Paul has worked with us. He, he did the original sound study where this was back, I think, five years ago, where we put two boats on the Cory Lake and put about 500 pounds of music equipment on it and cranked the music as high as we could and, and put sound uh, stage or sound receptors all over the property and actually off-site to kind of see what the sound broadcast would be. But it was one of those moments in my life where I was like, I can't wait till the day this opens because I was standing, I think I was actually with Salvador sitting at the top, sitting on a paint bucket, and I was texting the guys in the boat different songs that I wanted to hear, <laughs> and the sound quality was outstanding. But anyway, um, so Paul was the original author of, of that sound study on a foggy December day four or five years ago. And obviously, fast forward, you know, it's, it's a lot more sophisticated. So he's going to take you through um, the sound study, and I'm going to set the stage for it. So because we actually have a sound system designed for this, the center console in the center of the arena, so not at the top, not at the bottom, where they actually mix the sound, drive the sound, that sound is going to be run at 100 dBs. And Paul will get into that. So take it away, Paul. All right. Well, thank you, Terry. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, and thank you, commissioners, for your time this evening. Uh, I am Paul Bollard. I'm with Bollard Acoustical Consultants in our offices in Auburn, California. And we're delighted to be working on this project. Um, I'm going to skip through very quickly some of the main aspects of the noise analysis, but not everybody has a maybe the same understanding of, of sound. So I just want to take a brief moment and talk about some fundamentals. And that is specifically the unit of sound is the decibel. Uh, thanks to Alexander Graham Bell, he came up with that. And the decibel scale is exponential. It's similar to the Richter scale. And in so doing, it can take the huge range of pressure that impacts our eardrums and kind of compress it down into a manageable range from about 10 to about 160 decibels, as you see on the right. Um, now, the decibel level itself sort of defines the magnitude of the sound that you hear, but sound is also made up of many different frequencies, which is why things like uh, music sounds different than traffic, even if it's at the same level. And because the ear doesn't hear all frequencies the same, this A weighting scale was developed, which basically shapes the sound to match how we hear. And that's where you see the A at the end of the dB. So the dB is for decibels and the A is meaning A weighted. And incidentally, the noise standards for your city, the city of American Canyon are in terms of dBA, they're all A weighted levels. So the numbers, basically newborn babies theoretically have perfect hearing and they could hear a level of zero dB. As we get older, we lose some of our hearing. So most of us probably are in the 20 to 30 range for the lower end, but the threshold of pain is way up at 120 dB. Huh? <laughs> right. <laughs> and so uh, in between the, the normal range that we hear during day to day is usually between 40 and 80, depending on what we're doing and where, where we are. So we know that sound decays with distance. Uh, if you get further away from the noise source, the sound level drops off. But there's other factors that influence how sound decreases, and one of which is absorption in air. Uh, the air molecules interacting with the sound waves become absorbed. Um, vegetation will also absorb sound, trees, ground cover, grass. Um, we know that that will absorb sound. And significantly, shielding by intervening topography in buildings will also uh, reduce sound dramatically. And as has been shown already, the, the location of the amphitheater provides a lot of natural shielding of sound 
And the whole goal here is to focus the sound at the patrons that are in the audience and have the minimal amount of sound escaping into the neighborhoods. So if we go to that next, well, before I do that real quick, I'll just say that the city's daytime exterior noise level standard is 60 dBA, and that's essentially an average. So that's kind of equivalent to a residential air conditioning condenser that you might hear in your backyard. So if we go to the next slide, uh, as Terry already mentioned, the, the noise analysis that we prepared um, it was a collaboration with many folks, as you've heard from, but we used a sound level of 100 dBA at the mixing booth to do the modeling of sound in the neighborhood. And the reason we use that is because that's a very common sound level. We've measured bands from Willie Nelson to Florida Georgia Line to Pitbull, and we've seen this range of sound levels that they, they, they fluctuate, but on average... 100 is a very reasonable number to use for the modeling of sound for this amphitheater. We have a lot of experience with monitoring concerts, so that's why we went with this 100 dBA at the mixing booth. And Terry, if you want to go to the next slide. So you can see the overview here, and it's fairly complicated, but you can see the residences to the south. You can see the, the topographic contour lines around the Cory Lake. Um, additional Elements have been added in the canopy sound wall. Uh, additional berming is shown in green. So a whole host of different components came together for this very sophisticated noise model. So we took the amphitheater design from, uh, from Don's team. We took the, uh, the civil engineering from that team. And we took the sound system design from another team. And we merged it all into this noise prediction model. And if we go to the next slide, Terry. One, one second before you move there, just to, to, yeah. to, to Paul's point, if you look at the dark gray area there, the top of that, and I'll come back to this in a minute to address some of the concerns, but the top of that hill is basically 125 feet. So if you remember back to Will Carlson talking about the lobby of the hotel, lobby of hotel sits at 120. And Rolling Hills right there sits at about 110 or 112. So that 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 knob that sits behind the proposed residences there is the highest on that sort of southeast southern side. So we moving all the way around sort of from right to left on that southern side, we're raising that whole southern shoulder of the Quarry Lake for a host of reasons, wind, aesthetics, sound, et cetera. And we can do it because we have a very large canvas out there and we have a lot of um, different places where we can pull soil from, excess soil. Um, but then the other thing you'll see is that that blue box or that blue sort of almost semicircle, that's the outline of the canopy that PW drew. And you can see that's in the exact southeast section where the noise in theory would be leaking across Rolling Hills Drive down into the to the residents there in Vintage Ranch. And then the yellow obviously is the doors that are movable for both wind and sound that would be behind the stage. Exactly right. And what you're seeing here is sort of the end result of all of the merging of uh, the, the noise mitigation measures, sound control, existing residences, existing sound walls. You can see the green area represents the additional berming that's going to take place. You can see the canopy um, right there in the forefront of the view, kind of blocking the view of the amphitheater stage. So what this slide really illustrates is just the level of uh, intricacy and sophistication that went into the noise prediction for this project. And this was very iterative. There was a lot of back and forth between ourselves and Terry and the sound system designers to ultimately arrive at a system and a plan that would uh, provide an excellent acoustics within the amphitheater and minimal uh, transmission of sound into the neighborhood surrounding the amphitheater. That was the primary goal is the city has this noise standard of 60 decibels and that's the target. And so, as you can see here, there's, there's considerable detail that went into this modeling. And the next slide shows another view of the sound modeling. If you wanna skip over there, Terry, if you're ready. I'm sorry, did you go? Oh, this one. Oh, we had one in between. 
Did I go too far? This is just another, yeah, this is just another view that these, these are direct output screen captures from the noise prediction model. So you can see the level of detail within the amphitheater. You can even see sort of purple asterisks that represent speaker locations inside the amphitheater. You can see the green berm that is being put up, the canopy, the various aspects, and then the residences beyond. So we tried to account for real world circumstances here and we we're able to test you know, what height does this need to be? What height does the burn need to be in order to contain the sound to within the city's limits? And as Terry is indicating here, the net result were these noise contours, which were generated by the model, and with the ultimate goal of maintaining a level of 60 decibels or less at the nearest residences while amplified sound is being generated within the amphitheater. And given this design that um, we worked very hard on with all of the team players to ultimately arrive at, you can see we've achieved that, and uh, which is really very comprehensive. So we're very we're very happy with the end result, and uh, that basically concludes what I had to say. Unless there are any questions, I'd be um, I'd be happy to field those. And just to, I'll, I'll thank you, Paul. That was fantastic. It's, to Paul's point, I mean, we worked with different frequencies. We worked with different fre uh, speaker locations. I mean, all of this is being done real time digitally. And because we actually designed a sound system and because we had the mixing booth at 100 dBAs at center, at center stage or center amphitheater, we were able to really do something that we could stand behind. And it was important to me. I mean, because I have more homes to build in, in Watson Ranch, I have a hotel across the street. Um, we have, you know, 98 finished lots that we sold to DR Horton, um, albeit those homes have the advantage they're gonna, they, they had to put insulated glass on all the sides facing the, the Quarry Lake. But again, you know, we're here for a long, long time and it has to work. And so that's why we took it to, a, to such an extreme level with the actual design of the sound system. So we're gonna quickly get into uh, traffic and trip generation with Farron Piers. And Bob, it's yours, take it away. All right, thank you, uh, Bob Grandy with Farron Piers. I'm based in our San Francisco office and I led uh, preparation of the Watson Ranch Specific Plan EIR transportation assessment back in 2018 and also the transportation assessment for Broadway District Specific Plan. So what we're showing is a uh, the result of a trip generation assessment that we did to compare the envelope of trips for the updated project with the change in uses to the envelope of trips that were analyzed in the EIR back in 2018. And just a quick summary on, on the change, we have the addition of the Quarry Amphitheater, but we have the removal of two project elements that were evaluated back in 2018. And that includes the 600 student elementary school, which has been removed and was part of the trip generation assessment previously and a 25,000 square foot office building that was in the ruins as part of that 2018 EIR. So in doing this trip generation assessment, the table that you see, the top row in white, uh, shows the trips with the revised project with those changes. Uh, the second row in white shows the uh, data straight from the 2018 EIR. And the bottom row shows the difference or the delta. And then across the columns, you see daily trips and then AM and PM peak hour. So what we determined was that the revised project would generate about eight and a half percent fewer daily trips, about five and a half percent fewer trips during the AM peak hour, and about the same number of trips in the PM peak hour. And I think one way to think about this is that the amphitheater, uh, which is the new use compared to the removed uses, which is the school, and the office, uh, the amphitheater, the school and the office generate more trips on a daily basis and in the morning than the amphitheater. And so that's the result. That's why you see that decline and about the same number of trips in the PM peak. So to wrap up, what we concluded is that uh, you would, the project would be generating fewer or a similar number of trips in all the different time periods and therefore uh, a fewer or similar uh, effects on transportation. So with that, I think I'll turn it back to Terry. Sure. I want to add just a little color on, on Farron Piers and Bob. So he, he 
Bob's day job a lot of times is just boring when it comes to analyzing traffic on roads and stuff like that. <laughs> right, Bob? But I knew immediately when I proposed him doing this updated study how excited it got. So I started asking him questions. And so he has a lot of background in doing similar type projects, things like Chase, where the Warriors play. And so what was interesting as we got deeper and deeper into this was Bob's expertise, experience, and skill set from drawing from both how people use hotels for projects like this and how people use projects like the amphitheater and how the shared trip concept, which was not available to us. I don't think it was available to us, right, Bob, back in 2017, 2018. Um, but it has a big impact on this because somebody who's staying at the hotel, they're there for the concert. You know, they're going to park their car and they're going to walk across the street. And so that, that trip that typically would have been counted as two trips is essentially one trip with a whole bunch of other things attached to it. So behind the scenes of that, that plays a really big part of the overall trip generation study that, that Bob conducted for this project. Thank you, Bob. So let's see, what's next? Good neighbor policy. So we've had a couple of comment letters on the noise and the potential noise impact on Vintage Ranch. So I figured, you know, why not, you know, just take this issue head on? And so here's a, here's a photograph. I think I actually took this the other day. Um, but the, the, to frame this correctly, there was a hill here. So if you look at, if you look at Rolling Hills Drive, Remember that shoulder I said that's right behind? Basically, I'm standing on the shoulder when I took this picture. I'm at 125 feet. I am actually eye level or slightly above the second floor window there. So when Rolling Hills Drive was put in, in order to get the grade correctly to connect it to Vintage Ranch and connect it to Rio, Rio Del Mar as part of our overall infrastructure, that particular part of that hill was graded way down. And so that section right there, I believe, it's on the downhill side. It may actually be below 100. And so I think that the, the mitigations that we've put in place for the amphitheater, raising the shoulder, the canopy in the back that surrounds about a third of it, the movable walls behind the stage, um, the, the, the way we've, we've placed the speakers and the direction and so on and so forth. We don't need to put anything across the road in front of that sound wall. That said, I think that we need to do something there. And what I would suggest is that we work with those neighbors because irregardless of the amphitheater being approved or not, that condition exists and it didn't exist you know, before we started the construction of Watson Ranch. And so, you know, the, there would actually be, I think, more intrusion if the amphitheater wasn't there, the canopy wasn't there, and there was a function in the round building, and that noise was being broadcast straight across into those homes. I think there would be way more intrusion from a sound perspective, as well as people actually being able to see, you know, your upstairs. So I would like to propose as part of, you know, just being a good neighbor and being part of this process for the last 20 years and being probably going to be involved for at least the next 10, if not 20, that we meet and figure out a way to elegantly design something that works for them, but also works for us. So with that said, I kind of, I want to get to a conclusion here because I know you guys have already had a long night. Um, I'm super excited about this project. I mean, this has been a dream of mine, like I said, for almost 20 years. Um, I think it's a game changer for the project. I call it the pixie dust. I think it's the, it's the easy piece that ties everything together. Um, everybody, I think the pandemic has shown the importance of music in our lives. Um, but I think, separate and apart, it creates, I think, a real real, a real epicenter throughout the entire wine country. And I'm not talking about just, you know, the city of American Canyon or the city of Napa, I'm talking, or Napa County, I'm talking about the greater wine country because there's nothing north of San Francisco like this. And so I think the impact on this, I mean, the obvious 
to the hotel is a simple one. You know, if there's 150 events, the math that, that Bob pulls from other projects where he studied this, uh, three quarters of the rooms are booked that night. So half the, half the nights of the year, the hotel is essentially full. And you know this upcoming weekend with Bottle Rock, you can see what Bottle Rock does on a three day, I think it's three day, three day or four day event, what it does to hotel rooms. And obviously to the city, what that does is to the hotel tax. So it has a massive impact on hotels. And again, it's not just hotels in American Canyon. I've already talked to the, to the ED that, that uh, handles the group for all the GMs in the wine country. And this will impact Stanley, this will impact Caneros, this will impact Archer, this will impact Bartisano, so on and so forth, depending on who's playing here and what night it is. So, um, but then I also think it really helps bring the hotel to life because some of these hotel operators that still think this is, you know, wishful thinking, you come back to them with an approved amphitheater of 3,500 seats and a smaller one of 800 seats, I can guarantee you some of the ones that sort of were doubters will come back to the table. So it also changes the context of quality of those hotel operators, um, which I think, again, has long-term impact, not just selfishly on the project, but on the city itself. And so I think as you look at future projects coming into the city, this has massive impact on it. Influences food, imp influences all the other activities, and so I really do believe ultimately that once this, the amphitheater's up in operation, the hotel's in, you have the food and beverage art and, and music there, plus all the other activities, you've really created an, an epicenter for just, again, not just for the project, the city, the county, but the greater region. So thank you for your time. Really appreciate it and happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Terry. Um, at this moment, I'll go ahead and open up public comment. Nicole, do we have anyone on? Is there anyone online who would like to make public comment? Please raise your hand. Nobody's raising their hand. Okay, um, please forgive me. I do have one here of a speaker form with no name. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Valerie. <laughs> Hello everybody, I'm Valerie Cizek Maurice. Um, I'm just here uh, representing the American Canyon Chamber of Commerce um, and we are 100% in support for the amphitheater. We, as everything that Terry said, this is going to do wonders for not just American Canyon but for the whole greater region of Napa. You know, we're all in working hard to find more activities to go away from just the traditional wine tasting and food that we're known for in this region. And bringing something like this to American Canyon is not only going to connect us to Napa Valley, it's going to provide an opportunity um, to bring the valley down to American Canyon, which I would be amazed and happy to see. Um, so, you know, the hotels, of course, all three hotels in American Canyon, they're in full support of this. They've called me. I know a couple of them have submitted letters on behalf of this project. But, you know, we do, our hotels do pretty well, um, considering we're not necessarily a tourism destination. But this will increase the um, popularity in our community, the popularity in our hotels, and it will give all the residents that long-awaited activities and um, entertainment entertainment that we've been waiting for. So we wholeheartedly uh, approve this project and we hope that the Planning Commission takes it into consideration. I do understand that there could be some potential concerns for the neighbors, but I love the idea that Terry proposed to get ahead of that before it becomes an issue. So the Chamber of Com Commerce is endorsing this project. Thank you, Valerie. Do we have any other public comments? Yes, Beth Marcus. Um, Terry, this has been a project that's been going on forever, it seems like. He's going to put you guys out of business because with, with the ruins coming, you're not going to have to approve anything else. You won't have any drive-throughs to have to worry about. He's got it all, you know? I mean, it's so well thought out. I'm amazed at each time when he does, it makes me want to cry, a presentation it just gets better and better and better. I mean, he's, he's, 
done marvelous, uh, marvelous works. I, I, I don't, I'm just at awe. Um, I know I was on s some of the meetings way back when, when all this was going on, and it started as a town center, and now it's just, it's making us be on the map. Uh, the amphitheaters is gonna bring so much to our city. Um, the food, the beverages, the hotel, makes me want to, even though I live right across the street, makes me want to live in, a, just go to the hotel just so I could stay overnight just to watch the, you know, the things that are going on. But uh, I have always been in in, um, in favor of this. And I just want to say to you, you, Jeff, everybody, you're just doing a marvelous job. Thank you so much for what you've done. And I know Ray is looking down at you. Thank you, Beth. Uh, at this time, I'll go ahead and close public comment. Uh, commissioners? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Chair Cruz? Uh, I just want to say that uh, totally, totally, absolutely excited about this project. Terry and your team, thank you for one, for your commitment of giving back to, to American Canyon. Not only that, but uh, you're, you're salvaging our character with saving the ruins and giving that character and making that blossom out there. Excited, that's all I got to say about that. Thank you very much. All right, we'll continue down, Commissioner Allman. Sure, Terry knows me well enough to know I've got to have a few questions, right? <laughs> and it's not where's the condominiums, because these are amphitheaters. <laughs> but a um, cu couple of quick points for you. One, I'm curious, and, and it's because I have a background from when I was a teenager myself in sound. Um, but I'm curious. On the fig tree, where do the seats get stored? Um, well, remember I own a golf course, about <laughs> seven minutes away, eight <laughs> minutes away. Uh, I have a warehouse over here on Dodd where um, the existing Was Lock and Union is located today. Um, yeah, we're going to have a really big back of house, not on not on site, not to this scale. Okay. That will be elsewhere off site. Got it. Yeah. It, it's, that, that's like, the, 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 it's the logistics. Where you no. put them. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. Okay. That was first. Yeah. Good question. Second. Um, and, and my guess is you've already done this, but it wasn't specified. So I got to ask with the canopies uh, that you've got built into the project. Mm -hmm. Would extending them in terms of either forward or more side, any amount of distance and or adding additional canopies help in terms of the sound reduction for the neighbors, basically? I mean, I think the, the canopy, let me see if I can pull it up here really quickly. Um, So um, I think there's going to be a lot done between approval and, and final design, a little bit like the hotel where, you know, the city staff has given us latitude to, you know, finishes and reveals and details. I think that the, the closer you get that, that canopy, to the stage and of course a lot has to do with the material of that canopy you know the harder the surface right. just bounces sound yep but the closer you get that and that's why it's cantilevered back towards the the last row of seats captures a tremendous amount of sound but i could see that canopy potentially extending all the way around not, not the entire um, upper rim but let me see if i can find no, but from, from that picture and based upon what's been shown earlier, moving it more to the right wouldn't matter so much, but moving it more to the left yeah, here's seems a, to be where the issues Well, So here it would be more to the right, Yeah, actually. because, again, thinking about 
um, let me just ping out of there. If, if you think about where those homes are, so, the, so right. the, the stage, I set the actual stage itself, I mean from a compass. The stage face is absolutely due east at 90 degrees on a compass. So those homes are about at, uh, one minute, 25. those homes are about 80 degrees off, so just slightly moving to southeast. So that canopy, plus raising the hill, basically captures almost all the noise that's being broadcast. So you could raise it higher. You know, you could raise the, the wall that's paralleling rolling hills slightly higher and raise the canopy a couple of feet. But I think having the latitude to do that as we move through final design would be extraordinarily helpful because we'll continue to dial this in because, you know, it's important to the hotel, it's important to the residents, it's important to the rest of the, the folks moving into Watson Ranch. All of this affects everyone. Um, and you know the cutoff at 10 o'clock is an important time, but separate and apart from that, you also want to make sure that you know you're not just killing either either the artisan community or the vintage ranch community with with too much noise. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely, and, and, and so that brings me to the third question I had, which is I appreciate your good neighbor policy and and wanting to work with them, and and um, while I can't address any, I don't have a question that. Can really address sight line right. issues, but the noise issues is it on the table to consider doing window replacements on the uh, windows that face with more sound deadening windows? If, if there's an issue, of course, because we're already putting them in artisan. Right. And again, I think the good neighbor policy. I mean, it, it can be planting. You know, it's a. It's a. Let me go back to that slide because I think it's a it's a good slide to kind of look at. Sorry, it's just taking a while yeah, to, no to problem. load. Take your time. Here we go. Um, so, you know, there is a sound wall there. They've planted the the homeowner here has planted I think three fairly large redwood trees. So separate, they didn't plant them because of us. I think they just planted them because they liked them. They yeah. liked them, and they're going to have three very large redwood trees. I think that if you saw what we did on Rolling Hills, I mean on Rio Del Mar, those are very, those are seventy-two inch box olive trees. They're big. You can you could plant a tree, a, you know, a series of trees along that spine. It's a pretty tight spine. It's a, it's a narrow spine, so it's, it's going to be tricky. That said, I, you know, I would want more protection, but again, regardless of the amphitheater or not, it, it's kind of a raw spot, you know, in the way the whole road interfaces with our side of it and their side of it. So I think, you know, we, we proposed a very large, you know, at this point, just a simple wall design, but, you know, it's, it's, it would be behind their wall, so on our side of the property, and I think it was set back from the face of the housing about 75 or 80 feet. But again, that's not a very elegant solution to, to aesthetics. Yeah. So, I mean, again, I think, I think we can work something out there, including if we have to replace the windows on those two homes, you know? Got it. Cool. So, but I also, not a question, but a compliment. Yeah. Thank you. I, Love it. Thank you. I, I'm I'm thrilled to see how your vision is evolving over time. Um, I, you know, if you recall, <laughs> going way, 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 way back, there was a thought of one yeah. road in and out, <laughs> which I strenuously objected to, and now to hear the talk in yeah. your presentation about all of the emergency vehicle access. Yeah. Yeah. Love you, man. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it, it's, it's, it's great. Yeah. I, I think this whole vision, I think what you're looking to accomplish uh, really sets our city up for a very bright future. So 
Thanks. But we didn't even get into it, but the whole sustainability side of this. I was at Climate Now. Jason Hawley was was a moderator there on one of the panels. And, you know, again, back to some of the earlier comments about, about one of the other agenda items, it's a huge deal to us. It's a huge deal to me personally. My daughter just graduated from Columbia with a master's in climate, and she'd kill me if, if I wasn't, you know, <laughs> none of the EVAs are going to be hard surfaces. They're all permeable. You know, the, the Quarry Lake is not only detention, but retention. I mean, it's going to have a series of equivalent rice paddies along the southern edge of it that filter the water. I mean, the solar panels on the houses, I want to, I want to compost all organics on site. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. But also, we have the ability to do it because we have such scale. Yep. And so it's essentially like almost starting a city over again. And, you know, I heard on the panel that Jason was on, Kevin Miller from Napa was just, was, I mean, he turned a subject that's pretty dull. He's funny, he's articulate, and he can also move between the chalkboard and the field. And so he's a guy that I reached out to today and I said, you know, I want to sit down with you. I want to show you what I'm doing. I want to pick your brain. Not that the city doesn't, city of American Canyon doesn't have those kind of people already in it because they're moving that direction and fully committed to it. But just being to bring in all these resources to bear in this community that should be one of the greenest communities. When I say community, I'm talking about Napa County, the wine country, should be one of the greenest communities on earth. And the fact that they still allow people to burn, you know, great prunings is beyond me. Fair enough. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Goff? None of these are questions or comments. But sure. I should turn on my microphone, I apologize, <laughs> uh, is parking bleed in the neighborhoods. Um, so that is always a concern. Um, so that I wrote down. Um, bicycle parking was another thing I wrote down. I didn't see any indication of bicycle parking or like scooter housing, anything like that, because I do see members of the community not necessarily driving if they're going to attend. Uh, they're going to come by, you know, either they're going to walk, they're going to ride bikes, um, they're going to ride electric scooters, any of those things. So some type of storage facility or something would probably be beneficial to those people. Um, I love the idea of the walking streets. Uh, I like the open areas that you were talking about where you don't actually have to be there, but you can come by and sit down on the grass. Right. That brought animals into my mind. Are you factoring in, I'm going to walk my dog over, we're going to sit there on the grass. Is there something to satisfy animal needs? Um, your wine labels with the, uh, the art on them was just fantastic. I just love that. Um, I like to see the graffiti. I want to make sure it's still incorporated, which is I'm sure you do. Um, that brought me to graffiti on some of the sound walls. I noticed in one of the renderings there was a little piece of graffiti that said ruins on the side of the stage. Um, and I just like, there's an opportunity on a lot of that wall and that structure for, um, you know, displaying some graffiti art, um, which is just naturally to the ruins out there now. Um, a little bit of concern about varying water level inside the quarry. I don't know what you're going to do to address that. As we just came through all the rain, um, I'm sure that quarry level has changed significantly within the last couple of years. Um, so that popped into mind. I also thought about the stage with the doors in the back opening up, seeing the wetlands or seeing the, the quarry there in the water level. <laughs> water features, some type that can be incorporated into sound, something like that, or visual arts or um, lighting. Um, all this stuff just popping into my mind. Um, there was a comment about wind, and you know, if you've been here, yeah. wind's going to come. Oh, yeah. yeah. No doubt. Five o'clock at night, it's yep. going to turn on, and it's going to be blowing. So I'm glad there was some consideration into there. Um, as I move farther down, I love the good neighbor policy, um, the fact that you're reaching out to those people in advance. Um, a lot of possibilities there to, to um, address their concerns, and I'm glad that's going on now. Um, Final one I put down here was public safety. Um, 
I think this venue is going to be fantastic. I think it's going to be a huge draw, and people are going to come to our community, and that's what we want. But at the same time, when people come, that's more additional people out and about in our streets, out and about in our neighborhoods. Um, depending on the draws, that's going to could possibly vary widely. So that brought up public safety. Um, and I know that's not necessarily your concern, but is it, it is a concern for the city on what this is going to do possibly to our streets and our neighborhoods at various times. Um, other than that, that's all I have. I appreciate the presentation. Very, very excited. Not nearly as excited as you, but <laughs> very, very excited. So just let me quickly, I, I, those are all great comments, Commissioner. Um, There'll be robust bark, bike parking, scooter parking, both in the ruins at the hotel. I mean, just because of the nature of the Ridge to River and the Napa Valley Pine Trail. I mean, like I said, I think it's going to be truly a meaningful access to this. Um, you know, you may park, I don't know, two miles south and ride your bike to the concert or three miles south or whatever. Um, uh, parking in the neighborhoods, it'll be part of our conditions of approval and our transportation and parking management plan as well as security will be a really big element of the conditions of approval. Um, we didn't get into it, but in all likelihood, Rolling Hills Drive will not be a through street during concert evenings in, so that you will not be able to come down Rio Del Mar, you know, take a left on Rolling Hills and then go on through into Vintage. Um, but we're working through some of those details because again, if I was living there, I wouldn't want all of a sudden my neighborhood turned into a, a drive-through. Um, that said, I also do see the nature of, you know, water always seeks its own level, parking always seeks its own level. My sense is you could see people parking down, you know, just slightly north of Donaldson or south of Donaldson and walking up through those neighborhoods in through those walk streets of Artisan to the concert. Um, it's one of the reasons why we've tried to spread the parking you know, as much as we've done in many different places. Um, as far as additional parking, I've talked to the school district already about using the, the high school, you know, when it's not being used for parking. I think they have something like 2,000 surface lots down there. I mean, it's an easy golf cart, small shuttle back and forth. And it also happens to drop people easy access to 80, easy access to South 80, easy access to 37, et cetera, to, to reroute them home. Um, art, art is going to be a critical element of this, both the existing urban art and the, and the, the sculptural art surrounding the ruins. I think, you know, if I'm, if I'm looking into the future, uh, the walls will be curated, meaning, you know, you can't come out there and, and tag a piece with something nasty. But I think you'll have, my guess is somewhere between 75 to 150 different locations that that are always on a rotating basis that are in a lottery system where artists can, you know, apply to come out and paint when it becomes available. Some of them may be only there for a month. Another piece may be there for a year or six months or longer so that there's always art being rotated there. But I think it's also part of the experience to be able to, you know, come to the distillery, grab a glass of bourbon, walk outside and watch somebody painting this incredible piece. Um, uh, the wind, critical. And believe me, we're not done working on, on the wind because it's my least, I tell people, give me zero degree weather, I don't mind. Give me wind on a golf course, I'm not a fan of it. Sitting at, at lunch and having, grabbing my napkin, I'm not a fan of that in the wind. So wind is a really big deal here. And having gone to Oxbow a couple of times on some you know, less than desirable nights, it's not fun. Um, so we won't, we won't stop on that. Like I said earlier, the public safety will be a big part of the transportation management security plan for these. And to give you some context, you know, my guess is, you know, the ultimate operator of this will be a partner with us. And I already have in mind who I want. And then the actual promoter, you know, the Live Nation, another planet types, you know, we'll probably be two or three of those working directly with the operator. And so a, a whole lot has to happen over the next, you know, six to nine months as we move through the, the construction design phase of this and actually work on the plan. The idea is that we're operational spring of 2025. I mean, that would be, that would be a dream.
I just have a couple of comments. Um, oh yeah, go ahead, Commissioner. I'm sorry. Nice. <laughs> I actually have something to say. This is really exciting. Thank you so much for your presentation, and thank you so much for your vision. Um, I have to say, I moved to American Canyon in 2009. I actually purchased one of those Genoas that backed up into um, the ruins, and my um, son did a video MTV Cribs for his high school um, project, and he was like, and this is my backyard, and if he could see what's happening now, oh, that's it awesome. would be amazing, um, or he would be amazed. Uh, so, you know, we always wanted to know what was going to go on. We heard of you know, rumblings. So this being new, I can say, I feel very honored to be on the Planning Commission at this point in time. Um, my daughter just got married, uh, so she's looking to buy a house in the next couple of years. So I'm trying to urge her to buy into the promontory because she mm -hmm. likes the promontory winery. Mm -hmm. And just with all of the uh, things, the, you know, the epicenter that you're building in, at the ruins, it's just super exciting. And I think that'll draw a lot of families, young families to um, want to move into that area and I'm excited to live here and be a part of all this um, but so my questions and a lot of it got answered uh, was well the parking I had questions about the parking and I was going to ask where you were going to shuttle um, folks to and from the high school was a good um, one of the is there any other place other than well the high we the Jaeger family also owns a lot of land um, sort of outside the project um, you know, I've not talked to Adobe Lumber, but Adobe Lumber has a very large, you know, off hour lot that happens to be, you know, less than 200 yards or 250 yards from the amphitheater. So I think, honestly, there's a lot of different ways, but I think you'll also see the ride share of parking, the hotel, the person who's staying at the hotel parking, those two uses probably between the two of them probably account for almost 20 to 25 percent of, of the attendance okay and we have a big drop off for ride share at the and we didn't go through this and I apologize but at the end of Rolling Hills Drive when it comes into that major parking lot there's a big turnabout there nice for drop off the picture sort of reminded me like of um, Thunder Valley have you seen that yeah at the theater it looked like that that's it's gonna be awesome um, you said Fig Tree Amphitheater had 738 seats. Do you have an exact number of seating at the... Um I think we're using up to 800 on Fig Tree and up to 3,300 on the large amphitheater. And one, one comment I did want to make about, again, Don made this point earlier about this is considered a small amphitheater and then you move to the next level. When you get into a place like Concord or Shoreline, I think both of those have roughly, if I remember correctly, like 12,000 or 15,000 feet seats, but typically about three quarters of those seats are lawn seating. And again, at my point in life, I'm not a fan of lawn seating. I want to sit in a chair. <laughs> and so, so, and I don't think that's necessarily due to my age. So, I mean, which also I think helps drive the type and quality that we get, not only the person attending the, the venue, but also the act that's playing there. I think it has a big impact on it. So would the tightwad seating be up at the top of the amphitheater? And the tightwad seating is going to be over there on the shoulder. Mm -hmm. and, if the, and if the doors behind the stage are open, I mean, I was just in Nashville, um, Nate and I were, and we stayed at 21C Museum Hotel, which is one of the operators we're considering for the ruins, and they put us in this top suite facing the, the stadium, Taylor Swift was playing there the next week, and I believe it, you can't see the stage from there, but you, it's, they call it a listening suite where people rent it for the night for an ungodly amount just to be able to say they heard Taylor Swift play at blah, 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 but they can't actually see her. So the, the, the south shoulder okay. of that will be a really, I think, fun element, fun experience if you don't want to pay whatever the ticket prices are for that particular night. The other thing that we didn't point out is the rim of the Quarry Lake on the round building side. That will be seating where you'll be able to stand there and just literally look at the amphitheater, look at the stage. And, you know, I've walked out to dinner, grab a glass of wine and sit there for 20 minutes and listen to, you know, Morgan Whalen play. Nice. And then... Um my other question was going to be the hours of operation, but you said the cutoff time was Cutoff's 10. Cutoff's 10. Bottle Rock's 10. 
We did a study, and again, I didn't put it in the slideshow because there's just too many, but I would say it's kind of split. About half of them are 10, half of them are 11. Okay. And then my last question is, would you, will you be able to see the water? Oh, yeah. Oh, I mean, if the, if the doors are closed behind the stage, I would say mid-level up, you'll definitely see the water. Oh, and, and to your comment, Eric, the, so the level's up 25 feet of the quarry lake, and that's purposeful. And we retained, detained and retained all the water this winter off of the hotel site and the ruined site, as well as the Newell's. And the way we maintain the water level is we, um, city gave us permission to keep two wells on site. And so essentially we can maintain that water level probably within a foot or two. And it was important, it's also provide sound because it'll be on the north cliffs. It'll be buried down about six or eight feet and it'll just trickle down the north face there, you know, during the summer and fall as, as the water starts to evaporate. But essentially the base level of the Quarry Lake is the water table. Um, but I didn't wanna see a big bathtub ring around, around the Quarry Lake. And so the, the two wells gives us the ability to control the water level. And then we also have the ability, if we do get another winter like this, we can actually hold and then pump. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, thank you all commissioners. I just have a couple of comments uh, just in regards to uh, Commissioner Goff's uh, water shows. That was like one of the first things I was thinking uh, with young children as well and going to um, Disneyland and they have those shows and I was thinking of the the, the pirate boat coming and all of that. I was like, oh, some new ideas that potentially would come to attract uh, the, um, the neighboring cities in, uh, in Napa and uh, in the region. Um, also, one thing which is with that is just um, just with public safety. I mean, we think about a lot of these, um, you know, unfortunately these, these mass shootings and things of like that. Like, as we begin to um, develop and begin to sign up, you know, performance performers and things of like that, I think that's just one thing that's just really on top of my priority um, on that level. But I definitely have faith in um, uh, with you and the the teams uh, that you're working with to ensure that gets. Um, well covered. Uh, one thing I was curious about is just the maintenance and the upkeeping of the, the both amphitheaters. Like, how many jobs does that bring in <laughs> to the city, and what does that really look like? Just thinking about just you know, so many younger generations here that are looking for opportunities. Of I mean, careers in I don't have an exact number, okay. but if you look at the hotel, the ruins, all the uses within the ruins and the amphitheater. Mm -hmm. Um, hundreds and hundreds of jobs. Uh, and to an earlier comment, I also think that buying a home now or soon or a little later where you can, you're Napa Valley Unified School District, you can walk to the ruins, you can walk to all these different uses, the skate park, climbing wall, food, whatever. Um, or ride your bike is a very unique opportunity and you're buying a new home. And so I, I think it's gonna have a big impact, not just on the project specific, but throughout the community. I mean, I think it's gonna have a big impact on, on vintage very immediately, because again, it's all walkable. Okay. And then my last comment, just in regards to just um, shows and you know capacity, I know we have concession stands in both of the, the theaters there, but is there a, additional parking or potentially for small vendors or food trucks or we have a we have a food truck venue location within the ruins itself okay so that it'll be it'll be designed so that you know you're not running off a generator you can actually plug in so it's quiet and the seating will be well thought out intentional so you're not having to sit on a curb or on the street or whatever mm -hmm. um, but I think you know it opens up all kinds of possibilities to not only the, the fixed food services there, but, but my sense of it, you'll have everything from, from the food truck experience to hopefully a Michelin star restaurant or more, plus the hotel dining experience. 
So, you, so you're going to have a wide range and a little bit like the art. Mm -hmm. I mean, I see this as a ever changing food experience so that you can come back a week later, a month later, a year later and have a whole, di whole different experience. Over changes with time. And yeah. Culture and yeah. Yeah. I can see that. And it's kind of a, it's, it's sort of a, almost a perfect meeting point between, you know, the much more urban environment of the core Bay area and the much more suburban you know, up valley experience. So, so I think all the, the different things having to do with beverage and food and activities play a big role in, in, in making sure that all those things are, are ever changing. And frankly, it also gives people a reason to come back because each time you come back, it's a different experience, whether it's art or music or food or, or beverage. Come back or stay within the city. Or stay within the city, yeah. yeah. But I mean, come back to the, to the, the ruins, ruins itself, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, commissioners, looking for a recommendation. All right. I'd like to make a motion to approve a conditional use permit for development of the Quarry Lake and Fig Tree Amphitheaters, which consist of an approximately 3,300 seat and approximately 800 seat amphitheater within the Napa Valley Ruins and Gardens in the Watson Ranch specific plan. Assessor's parcel numbers 059 430-032 and 059-430-025, file number PL23-0009. Thank you. I'll go ahead and second that. Nicole, can I get a roll call, please? Yes. Commissioner Altman? Aye. Commissioner Goff? Aye. Commissioner Mohammed? Aye. And uh, Vice Chair Cruz? Aye. And Chair Malari? Aye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. I'm sorry. We would need to take a brief recess. Sure. All right. I will resume in five minutes. Thank you.
PDF. All right, right, I'd like to resume. Moving on to the Watson Ranch specific plan technical amendment. Director Cooper, floor is all yours. All right. Thank you, Chair Malari, Planning Commissioners, and members of the public. I'm Brent Cooper, Community Development Director, and uh, pleased to present to you a tune up to the Watson Ranch specific plan. Just uh, well, I probably don't need to do this. Um, we know where the Watson Ranch is located. We, we just talked about that for a while. Um, the project setting, it is uh, nestled in the east side of the city um, with some physical uh, features around it. It's on the eastern side um, next to open space, uh, bounded with the, uh, the um, railroad to the west. And then it also is influenced by the Napa Airport land use compatibility plan. And then where the uh, vine trail is proposed, there is a high pressure gas line there now. Um, there are two main property owners in the Watson Ranch consisting of uh, AC1 and the Newell family. Altogether, the uh, specific plan area has 309 acres. Um, AC1 has about 252 acres of that and the Newell family has 57. So I guess you're probably asking why amend the plan? We just uh, Commission just approved a use permit for the amphitheaters and talked a lot about the plans and the evolving community. Um, it really is uh, much more yet to be done. And um, by its very nature, the specific plan is flexible and intended to be mo modified over time. Um, as we know, the applicant is very mindful in ways to improve the plan. So as you kind of get your hands dirty, so to speak, and kind of start working with things, you encounter physical conditions and opportunities. Um, that might make the uh, plan better going forward. And that's largely what, what we're here to talk about. Um, it's not a wholesale change, but it's, it's kind of just um, giving it a bit of a tune-up. Um, I have a table here that shows some of the allocation changes from today's plan to what's proposed. Um, I don't like usually to show a bunch of numbers on a screen, but I can kind of walk you through some of the important ones. Um, one of the major changes that you might see in the plan is a shift uh, from the medium density 12, that's sort of a 12 units to the acre category, and then high density over to the medium density 16 units per acre. Um, in looking at the way the zoning is configured, uh, it's a much more flexible zoning category. 
Um, and it's a little more useful and allows for changes in market demand. And so that's a, 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 a shift that you'll see here of an increase of 13, almost 14 acres of that, um, and then a reduction in some of the other zoning districts. Um, another change that you'll see um, in the plan is uh, elimination of the school site itself um, and replacement of, for parks and open space. Um, the traffic assumptions, they talked a little bit about that with the amphitheater. Um, there is a plan for a community center in the specific plan. There's no funding for that now, um, and so the square footage for that has been removed from the plan. Typically, city buildings, park buildings, aren't subject to regulatory limits on intensity. Um, so should there be a time that we all hope for when there is a community center, uh, it's not going to be an issue with the specific plan itself. Um, the specific plan in terms of, of dwelling unit limits um, did never counted uh, as part of its total affordable housing units. So the total amount that's in the plan uh, 1,253 are market rate units. That's always been part of the plan. But now, of course, we're happy to have the Lemos Point affordable project. And so the plan's been modified just to acknowledge and recognize the construction of that project. So you can see there's, there's very little bit of changes um, in total acreage and, and land use assumptions. So I'm showing the kind of the before and after picture sort of on the, on the screen here. Uh, you can see a lot of colors and polygons and things, so uh, I'll kind of walk you through that. Um, but as I mentioned, there's really no change at all to the market rate dwelling unit limits or commercial square footage, which is typically the thing that you look at when, when you're looking at a change in a plan. And, and in this case, the build-outs uh, numbers are, have been left alone. Um, so looking at kind of the differences, I uh, mentioned that we have the school site that's being turned to a park. So you can kind of see kind of a movement of, of the park in the center spine of the specific plan. It straddles two property owners, uh, the Newell, of course, and AC1. And so those have been really shifted um, towards the school site and towards the lower uh, Newell parcel on the lower right-hand side. Um, one of the other changes here towards the south there is the community center. Um, and the uh, community plaza. Um, that's being eliminated from the ruins itself. Um, there are, are other needs for that property. Um, it is being shown on the right-hand side there for illustrative purposes, but in reality, I think there is still a conversation about where the correct, appropriate place is to relocate the community plaza and along with the community center at some point. Um, I'd mentioned, you know, the shifting in acreages from the other zoning to MDR uh, 16. I've got them kind of shown here where it occurs um, from the current plan and where it would go to in the, in the prior plan, kind of in the middle there. Um, not all over the place, just a couple of places. And then finally, um, we have um, the Newell South property. You'll see here has a, a medium density 16 and a high density being uh, redesignated as a park. So that takes care of the land use plan changes. Um, we have street plan, there's park plan, there's ped plan, so I'm going to go through each of these things. Um, and so the, with regards to changes in the street plan, we have the Loop Road straightened and changed to Beth Marcus Road. We shown here in the arrows. Um, down here in the in the uh, southeast, we have a new road that wasn't proposed initially called Mallon Way. Um, Newell Drive is being redesignated from three lanes to two lanes south of. Rio Del Mar, and that makes sense because now you have Malin Way to take some of the capacity. So we don't need three lanes if, if the road doesn't uh, warrant that extra pavement. Um, and then within the upper right-hand side there, there was designated a, a minor collector in the northeast area of the town. Uh, and that's been eliminated and will be replaced with local roads. Um, and then there are roundabouts proposed at certain major intersections 
um, and the current plan shown with the blue stars. So that's uh, I believe the changes for the street plan. So with the park plan, um, we already kind of went over the reallocation of some of the parkland um, that's reflected also in the park plan. And then also we talked about the community plaza. So they kind of all kind of match up and are internally consistent. With the bike pilot plan, um, we have a straightening for the uh, vine trail. So some of our high speed bicycles will like that, not having to go around some curves, um, in, especially in the center part of, of the ranch. Um, and then also along Mallon Way. So you have a much more straight shot uh, through uh, Watson Ranch. And then uh, the River to Ridge Trail, uh, which we're really excited about. It'll take us from Wetlands Edge all the way to the Newell Open Space in the future. It's great to see this project provide a nice segment of that. Um, a portion of it that would have happened between Mallon Way and Newell is, is going to go down Mallon Way to the uh, Newell Trailhead. It's in yellow, which you, doesn't really show up very well at all on the screen. But it's a little more of a direct route. And it also lines up, too, with the Vine Trail. So they kind of come together at that point. And they're all kind of heading towards the Newell Trailhead, which is, which is great. And then um, there was uh, to be on street trail um, on the northeast corner of the uh, property. Um, that, of course, would be bike accommodation through local streets. And then um, the bike trail, off street trail, was routed around the Lemos Point. Kind of as we look at these things, um, as we develop it, uh, there'll be an underpass on Rio Del Mar. So where, it, where this trail would have connected under the current plan, uh, it would have landed you at the top of an embankment because Newell is, is diving underneath the railroad. So it's now conveniently located around and safely around Lemos Point. Um, so that's a better plan. Um, we talked about this with... Um, uh, Fair and Piers, um, with the last project, there is a reduction overall um, with this new plan of uh, 1,500 daily net new trips. Um, with the outreach, much like um, the other two projects, uh, Nicole has been really doing an uh, awesome job in updating our website and getting the word out through Gov Delivery. It's a tremendous tool we have. And um, so we post the project on website. We invite people and have the capacity there with a link to comment. And uh, we also reach out uh, with uh, notices on Gov Delivery to our 3,800 friends um, that are interested in what's going on in American Canyon. And um, as well, we um, post the public hearing notices on our website. And that, too, is notified through Gov Delivery. Um, it's published in the Vallejo Times Herald per code, and um, the staff report, of course, is published on the website, and that too goes on in Gov Delivery. Um, we've also gone to the extra step of reminding people that tonight we have a hearing, and that goes out to Gov Delivery. Um, and through all that, we received a comment. Um, we have a resident who was concerned about the new street lights on Mallon Way, and so. Um, Public work staff has responded and will be providing, be able to provide a, a solution to their, to their concern. So it's great to be able to get the word out to people and, and be able to have that feedback um, and then be able to provide some meaningful and worthwhile input before it comes to the Planning Commission. Um, with this is a, a specific plan amendment is, uh, is uh, an ordinance. So this is really something that is important to do. Um, you have to think about, is it worthwhile all the effort to go to the Planning Commission and then two readings of the Council? So obviously it is to, to kind of get this plan tuned up and, and working a little better. Uh, we're here at the beginning with the hearing at the Planning Commission. Um, there is communication that will occur with the Airport Land Use Commission, which is necessary when you have an ordinance amendment. Um, and then, with all goes well, uh, we're expecting to take this to the City Council for first reading, which is a public hearing, on June 20th. And then there would be a second reading on July 18th. 
and then it would become effective 30 days later in August. Um, as we look at this, the project, given its minor nature, uh, intensity limits are held within, uh, complies with the original Watson Ranch specific plan final uh, program environmental impact report. And so for that reason, we're recommending approval. So if you have any questions, I'm glad to answer. Thank you, Director Cooper. Um, I'll go ahead and open up public comment at this time. Okay, if there's anybody on Zoom who would like to comment, please raise your hand right now. There's no public comment on Zoom. Thank you, any public comment in the room? No. <laughs> All right, I'll go ahead and close public comment. Commissioner, do you have any comments on the room? Commissioner Altman. Thank you. Welcome. Just a, a minor one, as I'm looking at this, and, and trust me, I get that this is a proposed plan, not final, changes can certainly be made, but the one thing I'm not liking is that there is a um, section, and it is the one south of Marcus Road, um, and uh, I guess that's west of Newell Drive in MDR 12 that in the prior plan had immediate access, that whole plot had immediate access to a park, and now it doesn't. Um, so if you've got one of the maps, I can, uh, proposed maps, yeah. So you see the one? Up. <laughs> You're, it's, uh, up. Some, something, and it doesn't have to be changed here, but I'm hopeful that something in the way of a park could kind of go in there because every other section pretty much has kind of direct, I mean, the MDR 16 um, at the bottom next to Newell, you gotta cross a street, you gotta cross Rio, but you gotta park right there. The MDR 16 uh, next to it, you gotta cross a street and the MDR 12, but you got a park that's kind of right there. It's just that MDR 12 has nothing, and I'd like to see that kind of dealt with. And also, you know, with that, with the Vine Trail going through, when the Vine Trail was going through in the old version, the series of parks, that makes a very nice ride. Here, a Vine Trail is going up. And I can't tell what's supposed to exactly be there other than a bike path, um, but it's kind of purely through as resi residential. And it also, as a, I'll say former bike rider, because it's been too darn long since I've been on the bike, but um, you know, dri driving through greenery is, is, riding through greenery is nicer than riding through the street and homes. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Well, and Commissioner Malton, I think you, you hit on it the plan is flexible. Right. Um, the areas in the north are the latter phases. You know, it starts kind of the south and moves north. Um, it does tend to have the, more of the MDR 12 or the lower density, but um, it's, there is flexibility in the plan um, for parks to shift even from what's shown here. I don't know if the applicant has more to say about that, but I think it's maybe too far out in the, in the horizon maybe to, to be looking at. That's a way to look at it. Okay, fair, fair, fair enough. I just wanted to kind of get it on record that that's the one thing when I look and visually see it that strikes me that's the otherwise perfect, makes a ton of sense and, and fully supportive. So I just wanted to kind of get that on the record. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Altman. Uh, Commissioner Golf. Thank you, Chair. A um, couple of things. Bike crossing at Rio Del Mar East um, for the Vine Trail. Under, over, is there just like a path? 
from one side of Rio Del Mar on the south, I'm it's sorry, south the, moving north. You're referring to the, the Vine Trail yep. crossing Rio Del Mar. It would be it would be a, at grade, like at grade crossing. Just a okay signaling. I hope it's just it's just a two lane. I'm road expecting at that a point. lot of people moving down through that on a bike because it's going to be a great ride. Um, so that's my only concern right there. You talked about the other one. There's a little loop around, and but that's the main thoroughfare, Rio Del Mar East. That bike trail runs right mm -hmm. through there. So it's just a little bit of concern there. I see I'm our assuming public work director here. making notes there. Okay. <laughs> Um, Nick's question was also bike related. Um, category of, of the bike lanes or bike paths along um, the roadways. You had marked those out in the bike plan. Um, I'm assuming there is a requirement, everything's class, what is it, one, two, I forget. So you had bike lanes going around the streets, you mentioned that. Um, and then on the outside, just making sure the quality or the category of those bike lanes. So there's a designated bike lane versus having to wave in and out. Um, final one is also bike related, not my final one, my next one, a lot of bike things. Vine Trail, now it's again, as uh, Commissioner Altman mentioned, it used to really go through a green, green belt with parks on both sides. Um, enjoyable ride, a lot of distance. Here it goes through really the housing areas and no real indication of what that path is going to look like. Um, you know, there's some bike trails in Napa, you go down and they're between housing and there's just two big walls in a, in a path and it's not very enjoyable to ride down. It's safe, without a doubt, uh, but it's not really something enjoyable to look forward to as a bike rider except getting through there safely. So just curious on what that trail may or may not look like uh, in its development, which will probably come as we go. Next question, and this has to do with the park map. So if you go to park, um, when something's labeled park, what does that actually mean? What does it mean when it comes to the citizens? What does it mean when it comes to access? What does it mean when it comes to use? What does it mean when it comes to restrictions? Because I'm looking up there and I see parks, but I also see labeled as a park is the Quarry Lake Park. Um, from everything we just saw, I brought up the question, what makes a park a park, and does that park have the same access, use, restrictions as the other parks in there? Um, you know, if I'm thinking of park, it's general access during daylight hours, I can go there, do whatever. But the Quarry Lake is not necessarily in my brain that type of park. Um, I don't know about restriction, access. Somebody be going to be able to go over there and drop a fishing pole line in there, and I don't know. Um, so that just jumped to my mind when it when it saw it labeled park. I'm wondering if it is a true, honest park as we think of parks, or not. Uh, Commissioner Goff, there there are some um, uh, clarifications to the Quarry Lake and others um, in the development agreement. Kind of is sort of a public and private space. Applicant might have better information on this than I do. Um, and the specific plan itself, while it may say park, uh, it is still, there are other um, policies in the specific plan that would suggest that it's the actual park acreage is based upon the development and what might be the park uh, generation based upon a five acres per thousand um, ratio. So what's shown here may not actually reflect what's built um, because as the development happens, it determines how the parks uh, acreage is. And then there's also flexibility to allow relocation of parks. So there's, there's a number, this is sort of conceptual, but isn't intended to be literal. Um, because the development review itself um, will qualify. And uh, we'll get some of that clarification uh, with respect to the lower right Newell property when we have the uh, promontory subdivision um, that will uh, develop all of the Newell's property. And so we'll kind of see some of that play out in, in a very short time because that one's near ready to be coming to the Planning Commission. Thank you, Commissioner Goff. Commissioner Cruz? No? Commissioner Mohammed? 
So speaking of parks, the little community center, what's that? What's the vision for that? Um, it is in the specific plan um, as an opportunity for the city to have a new location for facilities that are needed um, in this part of town. Um, but this, as I understand, there is no funding um, that's provided for it. The city would need to uh, come up with an independent funding source for it. And so this plan would remove the two acre plaza from the ruins itself, but it would need to be relocated somewhere within the specific plan at such time as um, the parks folks kind of are ready to go and, and are ready to talk about where an appropriate location would be. Okay, and then the public school in the current plan, what kind of public school would that have been and why was it removed? Um, I don't have really good information on the decision on whether there is a school is up to the school district and I'm informed that there um, there is a school agreement between the applicant and the school district um, and the other and the Newell family and I um, understand that's being modified um, and it's well in the, its way probably the applicant would have a better um, answer for you in regard to the disposition of the school site and, and what's led to it being um, replaced with park. Thank you for the clarification. Um, I, the only comment that I had was just alluding to just uh, in regards to just the parks. When I think of parks, I'm like, okay, being inclusive, dog parks, skate parks, just everything of the variation of the park zone. But I'm hopeful that we'll figure that out as far as we begin with the development. Um, and my only comment just disheartened with the uh, change of the, the schooling uh, situation, but we'll, we'll make do. Um, but thank you, I appreciate the presentation. Uh, at this time, I, if we have any more commissioner comments? Commissioner Gulf, nope. All right, let's go ahead and uh, make an adoption for this resolution. Okay, I make a motion to adopt a resolution of the Planning Commission of the City of American Canyon recommending City Council and the City of American Canyon amend the general plan to ensure consistency with, the, with and between the general plan and the Watson Ranch specific plan and amend the Watson Ranch specific plan PL22-0023. A second. Roll call, please. Yes, Commissioner Altman. Aye. Commissioner Goff. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Muhammad. Aye. Vice Chair Cruz. Aye. And Chair Malari. Aye. All right, thank you. Um, Director Cooper, we'll continue on with you. Do you have any? All right, thank you. Well, this is uh, the part I know we all look forward to. <laughs> where I review the hot items in the Community hot. Development Department. Um, we don't have that many left right now, but I will talk about the no um, juicy <laughs> ones that we're working on um, now and we'll soon be bringing to the Planning Commission. Um, on our first page of the Active Development Projects, item seven, we have a 100 unit townhome apartment project, Crawford Way, and um, I think we may be um, we might have recently received a resubmittal. Uh, William, did we get a resubmittal for that recently? Not yet, okay. So I get one's a little further out then. But um, they received comments from us in uh, late February, so we're, we're, we're due from a resubmittal from my perspective. On the next page, um, the promontory mentioned that at Watson Ranch. Um, the applicant there is very interested in moving forward. They've been working closely with us. Um, and uh, we recently got a resubmittal on the beginning of May. So, so that one I think we're looking at perhaps bringing to the commission is June maybe or June or July? Maybe July because hmm. they have a Okay. So some details. So perhaps in July. Of course, we have a lot of construction going on. 
um, not really a, a change per se. Uh, let's see, I think we have some, um, some new pre-applications. We have a pre-application for a new warehouse on Commerce Court. Um, and so the, um, uh, an effort by the applicant to get information in advance of submitting their entitlement application, but that would be the third of the three parcels that's vacant right now. Um, let's see, in terms of city-initiated projects, our um, housing element update, we did submit um, comments to a response to the state on, our, on their comments. At the beginning of May, um, HCD has 60 days to respond. So we've almost used the first 30, so perhaps in June we'll get comments. Hopefully positive ones. Um, we did, after all, do a general plan amendment and some zone change to respond to them, so I'm hoping they like that. Uh, let's see, the uh, smoke-free multi-unit housing ordinance, that's um, one that's um, in the neighborhood preservation component of the municipal code and the city council approved that in the middle of May and so that will be take effect. This is um, a prohibition of smoking in uh, duplexes, apartments, attached housing um, type. Quick question for you. Mm -hmm. When that prohibition of smoking does that include both tobacco and cannabis, or is it? It does. Okay. Both indoors and outdoors on the grounds. A vaping and other forms of, of uh, combustion. Uh, let's see, the Paoli Watson Lane annexation, because we're working very hard on that. Um, the public review period for the environmental report was concluded at the end of uh, April. And uh, we have our crack team working on responding to comments for that. And um, um, there is a, a, for the Napa County, um, they're working on updating their land use compatibility plan for the Napa airport. And uh, we had a meeting in April and a third one will be happening in June. Uh, what was interesting to learn, I might have mentioned this at the last meeting, is that the D zone, which arcs across the city, is this zone that doesn't, or housing is not supposed to, be, to occur. Uh, when you apply the, the updated um, calculations for noise, uh, which also takes into consideration the way the airport is being operated today and projected in the future, it shifts that D zone uh, cal by calculation um, from between a third of a mile to point, almost like point, point 0.6 of a mile north. Um, and yet the draft plan shows the D zone staying put. So uh, anyway, we'll be providing some feedback on that. We're hoping that they use um, a data-driven plan. So that's my update on, on the other things we have cooking. Thank you for that. Uh, let's move on to any uh, commissioner items. Starting down back. Oh, go. Sure, I'll go ahead, thank you. Um, first one is one of the things I missed out by being here tonight was the scholarship and awards assembly for the seniors at the high school. Um, I can't verify the exact number, but I was in a conversation earlier today that my understanding is somewhere of $160,000 worth of scholarships and awards were handed out this evening to the students in American Canyon High School. By far our largest number. Um, increased donations from civic um, entities has made all of that possible, including a lot of the businesses that have come across this uh, forum over the last few years. So it's nice to see um, the businesses getting involved in the youth. Um, so that was one. My final comment um, really is in relation to all of the feedback that we received um, relating to drive-ins. Um, and it's just going back to, I think, the essential component here, as I mentioned earlier, is for the city to take some actioning on idling. Um, 
and I think that action, as many muni municipalities are now doing, um, is an idling ordinance that will reduce the amount of time cars are allowed to idle in our city. I think that addresses um, most of the concerns that were brought forth um, related to the drive-through component. Um, and I think it also allows the city to take some action um, for the climate action resolution that the citizens of this city have obviously um, spoken for um, and would support. Um, that's what I have. Thank you. If I may, Chair. Sure, Mr. Oley. Uh, thank you. <laughs> no, it's good, great work tonight, and I uh, appreciate all the comments and everything. I want to address that last particular comment. The commission might not be aware necessarily, um, but the council, in part, uh, the part of their purpose in forming the new Open Space Active Transportation and Sustainability Commission was to begin to address sustainability issues, and they referred this topic and some others to them to, to look at. So on their work plan for next year, which we'll be discussing at council on June 20th, uh, is looking at the interim climate action plan, some low hanging fruit, but also some more meaty policy issues. So I expect this body will start to see some activity from that group, including some community engagement, because kind of what you're talking about is some community engagement. We've heard some voices talking about drive throughs We haven't had a lot of community voices, we don't think, and so that's part of what the council's asked for, is let's engage the community and understand where they are on drive throughs and emissions and, and to make sure those voices are being heard. So that is on the, uh, the docket for the OSATs in this next fiscal year, and I wanted to make sure you all knew that was, uh, that was coming down the pipe. That's all I had. Thank you, Chair. Commissioner Ullman. Thank you. As uh, I guess the uh, active Jew in the community, um, <laughs> I, I want to uh, make a couple of comments, including one expressing a little bit of frustration with our city council, because we are a city who's posted signs and whatnot about we love everyone. And the city has made proclamations for various uh, things like um, the uh, Pacific Island uh, Heritage Month and so on. Well, we are May 25th, I believe, and May is also Jewish American Heritage Month. And there's been no proclamation. Additionally, our mayor has not signed on to the uh, mayor's um, petition against anti-Semitism, uh, which I would love to see happen. And I'm happy to be a resource and point people in the right direction and provide information on any of these matters. But I, I, you know, it's a little frustrating to see efforts made in many areas, and I applaud those efforts, but that uh, for whatever reason, my people seem to get left behind. Um, so I just wanted to kind of take a moment and, and kind of comment on that. And uh, additionally, starting uh, this evening is one of the three uh, major Jewish festival holidays called Shavuot. So I would like to wish everyone who may celebrate, beyond me, a uh, Chag Sameach Shavuos. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Ullman. Commissioner Cruz? You know? I just want to say that I'm really excited with all the development that we just approved uh, today. Um, moving forward, again, it's an honor being part of the commission, and have a great evening, everybody. Thank you. And Commissioner Mike. Uh, I think the last one I'll just save is uh, we have a Meet Me in the Streets June 14th. Yeah, June 14th. So I'll be eager to see all of you out there and those that are on here on this panel here with me. Um, at the table. All right. Um, let's adjourn. Have a good evening.